Hey guys, something a little bit different today. I've compiled all the best malicious compliance stories. If you like this compilation style of video, let me know. I might release more with some of the best stories over the years. Are you sure you want me to get rid of my server that you use daily? Have fun dealing with the aftermath. I worked for a large consumer electronics retailer for many years as technical support. I was also in charge of all the internal devices and computers employees used at my location, not the computers that were on demo for customers to use. Comes into play later. The retail stores offer technical support for computers and mobile devices. Now, for technical support, there were two laptops that I was authorized to configure for use by technicians, load useful software, and allow admin privileges. One such useful tool is called RecBoot. This application was freeware, I checked the license, and not an internal tool. Back in the days when iDevices had a physical home button to put the device in recovery mode, the home and power button would need to be pressed. RecBoot allowed a connected device to be put in recovery mode by clicking the recovery mode button. Easy and simple. A lot of devices had this home button stop working. When you were able to access the device, assist of touch could be used for a virtual home button. If the device passcode was forgotten or too many attempts were made and the device was permanently locked, a restore was needed. To do this, the device must be put in recovery mode, important for later. Two laptops with sometimes dozens of customers looking for support and needing to restore iDevices or reset account passwords was not great. Obviously, customers would get impatient having to wait longer for support. This was brought up to management. Their solution? Well, there are tons of demo computers. Connect the devices and do restores from them. There you go, Bob's your uncle. These demo computers were loaded with a demo image and configured that any changes made would be reverted when the computer was restarted. Also, the admin password was a guarded secret. I had the password but was definitely not allowed to share it. To run RecBoot after it had been downloaded from the internet required the admin password, so it only worked for restores. So to do a restore, each demo computer would have to download the restore image, many gigabytes of download, and it would take 20 plus minutes just to download one, not even complete a restore. Each device model would need a specific restore image. You can imagine this was not ideal, but to management, hey it works, problem solved. What I started doing was I would unfreeze a few computers, transfer all of the needed restore images onto them from a local server, and freeze them again. I would also transfer RecBoot, launch it, enter the admin password so it wouldn't require it again later. This server was on the public network and therefore was not managed by the remote IT team as an internal computer and had no corporate policies installed. There was no confidential information on it, I had passed this by the appropriate channels and was given some guidelines to follow. If all was followed, I was allowed to have the server running. Everyone seemed to think it was a great idea and it really helped. It was a lot of upkeep. Every time a new software update was released, I would have to unfreeze, transfer and then refreeze the computers. If a new demo image was installed on the computers, I would have to redo it as well. It would take a few hours to get done. I was happy to do it, it saved a lot of time in the end, and we were able to offer better service to customers. Well, the person in charge of the demo computers did not like it. Apparently corporate didn't either. I was told I could not modify the demo computers in any way. I came up with a solution. With the server already running, I would share the logins with the technical support team. I could grant admin access on the server, they could run the tools needed, more specifically RecBoot, and should a restore image be needed, they could transfer it locally over the network to the demo computer they were using. Much faster. All was well until we got a new lead technician. Jeb. Now unlike other stories, Jeb was not an external hire, but a technician who had been promoted. We had worked together for a few years at this point, and he was actually a decent guy. I'm not sure if the power went to his head, he just wanted to impress upper management, or if he was being pressured by management, but after being promoted he became a different person. Suddenly he was the boss and things were done his way and that was that. During a physical inventory of the store, it was noted that my server was not a managed internal server, 
nor was it a demo unit for customers. As such, it needed to be decommissioned and the hardware returned to the warehouse. Jeb brings this to my attention as I am the only one who takes care of internal devices. He asks that I make it gone by the end of the next day. I pointed out that I had followed the guidelines and that he knew full well how useful this was. I brought it up that it would impact his metrics on customer wait time and satisfaction, something I'm sure he was hoping to improve. He wouldn't have it. He cited that any computer on the network needed to be managed and my server was no longer approved. He also let me know that the two laptops that were being used by the technicians were going to have an image installed on them and now be managed units. I tried to argue, at least for my server, and he threatened to write me up. Alright, I'll let you dig your own grave. He also sent out an email to the whole technical support team pretty much forbidding the use of any non-approved software. I wiped my server and sent it back to the warehouse. Without my server and now the two laptops being managed, no one had an admin password except me and the IT team who was remote and tickets were usually only responded to in 24 to 48 hours. But being managed, no unapproved software could be installed anyways. Cue the next night, first day without the server, when I get a call from Jeb in a panic, asking how he could get Wreckboot working and he really needed it. I had the pleasure of telling him that the server was gone and no unapproved software could be installed. As per company policy, the admin password could not be provided unless a ticket was opened with IT and his need for it was approved, which was likely to take a few days, if it was even approved. Turns out a customer started throwing a fit. Not only one, but multiple people over the course of the day, and each time it was escalated to him to deal with. Each time, having my server would have put a swift end to the problem. This particular customer had an iPhone that was only about a year and a half, only one year of warranty, and the home button stopped working. They had been in previously and were given the options of the virtual home button, free, paying for a replacement phone, a few hundred dollars, or buying a brand new phone. Repairing the home button was not a repair offered. They had opted for the free option. This time, the customer's kid had played with the phone, entered the passcode wrong, and the phone was disabled. Of course, the customer doesn't have iCloud set up or a recent backup, so no remote wipe and no way of backing up the info. To top it off, they would have to spend hundreds of dollars for a replacement phone or buy a brand new one. Having had the phone for less than two years, their phone contract was not up for renewal with their cell phone provider. Needless to say, the customer was pissed. After that day, customer satisfaction and wait times tanked. He had to deal with a lot more escalations. He definitely was not looking good in the eyes of management. After a few months, he was demoted back to technician. I didn't advocate to bring my solutions back. I left the company shortly after. So if you worked in an environment like this where somebody got promoted and you had to deal with them directly trying to take over and make things way worse for everybody, and then of course they got demoted back down because they didn't do very good at their job, would you be able to look past that and go back to being kind of buddy-buddy one of the guys with them, or would that forever change the way you see them and interact with them even in the business place? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Burn the Oil. Don't touch the jukebox till all of entitled customer songs have played? Fine by me. I'm a bartender at a little hole-in-the-wall watering hole with a very regular and very loyal customer base. I had last night off, so I met up with a friend at another bar for a few drinks and some food. After supper, we decide to walk to the bar I work at to cap off the evening. We get there and there is a good energy going on. The music is a bit louder than usual and there is maybe 10 patrons in the bar. We have this one customer who is extremely wealthy and it's nothing for him to spend $200 to $400 per night multiple times a week buying everyone rounds. As such, he's treated like royalty around there. So I'm sitting there having a really good time, enjoying a beer, and decide that I want to add a song to the jukebox. I grab a $5 bill and walk over, 
only to notice 63 credits showing on the screen. No big deal, I think. I'll just put my $5 in, request a few songs, and leave the 63 credits untouched. But no. Our wealthy regular, let's call him Jack, sees me perusing the jukebox and comes up and physically pushes me away from it. I ask him what the freak he thinks he's doing. He says those are his credits and no one is allowed to touch the jukebox till he's used them up. I point out that I have my own $5 and no intention of using any of his credits. Nope, not good enough. No one is allowed to touch it until he's done with them. I know it's not worth arguing, so I step back and he starts requesting songs till he's used every single credit. Each song costs 2-5 to five credits, so he put in a lot of songs. Each song gives you the option to pay an extra 2 credits to have your song played next, but I noticed he wasn't using it. This particular brand of jukebox has an accompanying phone app. I didn't have it downloaded prior to last night, but I do now. I calmly sat down at my table with my friend and put my plan in motion. I go to the app store, find the app, download, install it, create an account, and purchase $10 worth of credits. I request two songs and pay the extra two credits to fast track them. I sit there in quiet anticipation and I can see that Jack is starting to get into a groove with the music he'd requested, Vietnam Rock. His heart gloriously sinks when Bomb 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 by Sam and the Womp comes on. No big deal guys, his song must be next. Nope, it's Wannabe by the Spice Girls. He sits down dejected. I quickly purchase another $20 in credits and request Baby by Justin Bieber, Live in La Vida Loca by Ricky Martin, Axel F by Crazy Frog, Foil by Weird Al Yankovic, and Fast Track every one of them. Partway through foil, I notice Jack sulking in his chair. So I purchase another $20 in credits and proceed to request Never Going to Give You Up by Rick Astley, Who Let the Dogs Out, Barking Mad Remix by Baja Men, Numa Numa by Ozone, Paparl Americano by Yolanda B. Cool, and Star Wars Cantina March by John Williams. They're starting to realize something is up. So Jack and a few staff who were on last night convene at the jukebox to try and figure it out. At this point, the cantina march is playing. They turn the jukebox off, then back on again. Doop, 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 doop. They turn it off, then back on. Doop, 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 doop. Each time picking up where it left off. I can't hold my laughter and let out a muted chuckle. One of my coworkers catches on and comes over with her phone in her hand with the app open and shoves it in my face with a how freaking dare you yada yada yada. I quietly get up, down my last mouthful of beer, put my jacket on and walk out without a word. I walk down the street to a greasy spoon that our staff and customers are regulars at due to proximity. I sit down, order a beer and burger and proceed to log back into the app. I purchase another $10 worth of credits and fast track All I Want for Christmas by Mariah Carey and Mickey by Tony Basil as one last bite me to Jack. I can only imagine the fallout I'm going to face Monday afternoon when I show up to work, but whatever. My $40 was no less valid than his and no one customer gets to commandeer the tunes for the entire night and physically block anyone else from touching it. Side note, yes, I did realize partway through my shenanigans that I could have just requested What's New Pussycat by Tom Jones multiple times, but by then I was too deep in. What do you guys think is the most annoying song that you could request on this jukebox to totally ruin the night for this guy? My personal vote is maybe Chacaron by El Chambo. I'd like to hear your guys' suggestions because that's a great thought. And our final story of the day is by Ruck H. Lint Chocolates. This past Christmas, my mom just told me her malicious story. She was looking for stocking stuffers for the whole family and found a Linder chocolate coupon online. 150 pieces for like 40 bucks, which is a pretty good deal. She did not read the coupon, but screenshotted it and brought it to her local outlet store to pick out the treats in person. It was a tad busy in the store, so she waited in line. When it was her turn, she showed the coupon. The conversation went as such. 
Hi, I have this coupon. I'd like to pick up my chocolates. Clerk inspects coupon. Sorry, that is for online orders, or if you call it in, we can package it for you. Okay, so I can't pick out the chocolates. I will need to call it in. I'm here now. Sorry, that's what the coupon says. Next in line. Again, it's pretty busy inside. Mom steps out of line and pulls out the phone. Clerk turns around and answers the phone. Mom audibly so she would hear her twice through the phone and in person. Hi, I'd like to place an order for 150 pieces of chocolate. Can you please provide me with your full menu one by one? Clerk turns around mortified and quietly says, Please just pick up the chocolates you want. We will honor the coupon. Was the clerk too dumb to realize that anybody in their right mind that's there to get those chocolates would step out of line, break out the phone, and call them right then and there? I know it says online or phone only on the coupon, but just work with the person. It's not like they would ever just go home and put a call in. Hey, at least you got our chocolates. Dissolve my department, demote me, and expect the same output? You got it, boss. I work in a highly specialized field where it's very difficult to find and train suitable personnel. By pinching pennies and not holding his promises about pay grade changes, my boss successively drove away the three specialists working in the department I led. Right before the last one put in her notice, he argued that a two-person department didn't justify a leadership position and demoted me, and we were integrated, on paper, to another department. This was done outside of any legal framework and with a one-week notice, which is illegal. During the reorganization, the manager of the department we joined was assigned to R&D, and another manager and his deputy promoted to lead the department's daily business. We effectively had no less than three supervisors, all of them lacking managerial training and technical knowledge about the duties of our now defunct department, and only one of them can read the language in which 50% of our reports are written. Right after the reorganization, I was granted one last meeting with the boss, where I pointed out that several of my duties cannot be bestowed upon the mere foot soldier I had become, nor taken over by the new leadership. He answered that his decision was final. I was to revert to my previous job description and take up any future matter with my new supervisors. I did just that and some more. I read the state law and ordinance about state and university employees. Should have done it earlier in hindsight. I discovered that the illegal move by my boss doesn't carry any penalty so there's screw all I can do legally. I'm allowed to take on private mandates for anything that is not explicitly mentioned in my job description. It's a gift normally meant for professors. I get to take up to 15 days of additional paid leave per year to hold a public office. The pay grade I reverted to doesn't match my responsibilities today, even excluding the absence of leadership position. And there's an independent procedure with state HR to reevaluate the pay grade. The kicker? My old job description that dates back to seven years before is short, to say the least. Three lines that don't even cover 50% of what my duties in the last seven years consisted of. And I have a side gig as a retained firefighter and fire instructor for which I use to take vacation days. This counts as a public office according to state law. The fallout. My new managers both signed the authorization to take on private mandates and public office without understanding the implications. I used all of the 15 days where I legally get paid by the fire department and my employer at the same time. I took on several private mandates, totaling nearly an additional month of salary for four days of work. And the pay grade reevaluation has brought me back to the same income as with the previous leadership position. Oh, and since my specialty now has a bus factor of one and my new supervisors have been unable to staff the open positions, it was very unlucky that I fell ill at the time where I had to submit paperwork for a research grant, costing the institution $30,000 in lost research funds. So knowing that the company did nothing to assist OP on their job duties and having OP being the only one capable of doing it all, do you take enjoyment in the company losing $30,000 because OP was unable to work? Or do you think it's just more exactly what they deserved and not necessarily something to get a lot of joy out of? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Riley Smiley. It's usually not a good idea to pick 
of the person who keeps the department ahead of schedule. So I work for a grocery store as a personal shopper for their in-house grocery pickup and delivery service. Not to toot my own horn, but I am uncontestedly the fastest and best employee in the entire day shift. For context, I can pick around 100 to 120 unique items per hour, while the average person does around 60, which is the expected minimum. It's safe to say that this department relies on me quite heavily, to the point where the department manager has to find two people to replace me when I can't come to a shift. This is mainly because I find the job pretty boring, so I throw in an AirPod and listen to music. I'm fast, mainly because it makes me feel like I'm actually doing something while I'm here. It's also important to note that there's no incentive for me to perform more than anyone else. I don't get paid more, there's no recognition, I just do it because it keeps me busy. Now one of the assistant store managers doesn't like me. I can't figure out the reason, but she doesn't. Either way, she decided today that it would now be a rule that you couldn't listen to music while picking groceries as they didn't know what you were listening to. Nothing in relation to not being able to hear customers, which I could anyways. Now I had asked others about this rule, and they hadn't been told anything and were still wearing earbuds and listening to music. It's important for us to have at least a one hour buffer. It allows us to call customers to review changes made to their order and then adjust anything as per their request. This is how we ensure their satisfaction. Today, it was really busy. We could barely keep that buffer with me at full productivity, which I was until being told no more music. That's when things began to nosedive and fast. Within half an hour, we had lost half of our buffer, and by the time I was done with my pick, we had completely lost it. This assistant store manager is now being chewed out by the GM because we're behind and that's a serious issue. She then looks at the chart that shows our pick rates and asks him where I am, explaining that we shouldn't be behind with me there. All the while, I'm sitting there taking my sweet butt time riding bin tags until she confronts me as to why I'm picking so slowly. I explained that I had no obligation to go above and beyond, and that because there was a clear double standard being held, I didn't see a reason to perform at a higher level than the rest of the department. After the cogs in her head finally stopped turning, she realized that it is probably best if she allows me to listen to my music and sends me on my way. Within two hours, I've created us an hour buffer again. Needless to say, she learned an important lesson in cause and effect today that I doubt she'll be forgetting soon. I think it just goes to say, if you have somebody that's a clear MVP and not only that but is a team player, don't piss them off, don't do stuff that gets in their way needlessly, you're just going to end up causing stuff that makes it worse for everybody. This next story is by Shocker Rocker, The Day I Lit an Ambulance on Fire. Several years ago, I was working as an EMT for a small private ambulance company which contracted primarily as a transportation service. The ambulance company employed a pair of mechanics that did regular maintenance on each unit and fixed problems when they came up. The company's CEO was pretty stingy when it came to money, so the rigs were old and a lot of the mechanics' spare time went towards restoring the Impala owned by the CEO's son. I wasn't well liked by the owners and management for one reason or another, but I suspect it's because I frequently spoke my mind. This means that I was tasked with the worst trucks on the worst shifts. One day, my partner and I were dispatched to a scheduled patient transfer from a long-term rehabilitation facility to their home. On our way to the facility, our ambulance overheated. Dispatch was notified and we were told to let them know when the truck cooled so we could get back to work. An hour later, the truck was still hotter than I'd like and I let dispatch know that we needed a new unit. Their solution was to have us drive back and swap our gear into a fresh unit to finish our shift. We would need to drive across town to get back to dispatch, so I let them know that it would take a while as we'd need to pull over every single time the engine overheated. Little else was discussed and we started back. I figured I'd stick to the smaller side roads and take my time avoiding the freeways for the safety of ourselves and other drivers sharing the road. I should also mention that every ambulance has a GPS reporting system that reports all of our telemetry so we're tracked every moment of every day. The moment we pass the first entrance to the freeway, the dispatch manager, 
We'll call her Mary, calls us on the radio and angrily asks us to explain why we're not following instructions. I opted to give her a phone call to settle this and not have a long drawn out discussion on the public airwaves. Mary accuses my partner and I of wasting time and milking the situation so we wouldn't have to take our share of calls. Mary goes on saying that our intentions were obvious since we're not taking the freeway and as such, when we got back to dispatch, we would be dismissed for the remainder of the day without pay and they would investigate to see if further disciplinary actions would be needed. I tried to let her know that driving on the freeway was unsafe and I would have to stop more frequently but she wouldn't hear it and told me to get back as fast as possible, no more delays. Cue malicious compliance. Our patient monitoring equipment is incredibly expensive, and management has stated in the past that if we break it, we're on the hook to replace it. So I tell my partner to pack it all up and put it just inside the side door because I wasn't sure what would happen, but chances were good that we'd need to grab it quickly and make a run for it. So as directed, we turn around and head back to the freeway entrance at full speed. I think we made it to the end of the freeway merging lane when the temperature gauge started to redline and we had another 12 miles to go. The further I drove, the hotter the engine got and it started to produce white smoke. Lightly at first, then heavier as we approached the big hill just before our freeway exit. Several cars were passing us and honking their horns to alert us of our peril, but there was no stopping this train. We were filling up the lanes behind us with smoke, and the smell was wretched but the ambulance was still running. As we made it to the top of the hill, the engine cut out and lost all power. Smoke was pouring out the sides of the hood but my vision wasn't compromised, so I coasted it over the shoulder and got it as far off the road as I could safely manage. Once I threw it into park, flames erupted from the engine. I told my partner to get as much equipment evacuated as she could and I grabbed the fire extinguisher. As I'm trying to put out the fire, my partner is on the phone letting dispatch know that we were forced to stop because our ambulance was on its way to a fiery death. I guess at this point our situation had received enough attention that someone had called 911 and the fire department was dispatched but they pulled up on the opposite side of the freeway, watching to make sure that things didn't spiral out of control. We were sure to let dispatch know that the fire department had also arrived. Shortly after our call, the CEO's son showed up in his Impala to pick up the equipment as well as myself and my partner. He was on the phone trying to get a flatbed tow truck out as fast as possible so his smoking ambulance could be removed from public view as quickly as possible. The unit was picked up and towed back to the garage, all while the fire department sat and watched. My partner and I were still sent home for the rest of the day. I celebrated the early start to my weekend with a few drinks and nothing else ever came of it. That unit was retired and never saw service after that, but the mechanic said they owed me a beer I guess, because I brought the end to the worst rig in the fleet and they no longer needed to provide upkeep on it. OP even included a picture of the ambulance smoking on the side of the freeway at the bottom of this post, and I think it's kind of funny how the mechanics came to them and said, oh thank god you got rid of the worst rig in the entire fleet. It must have really been an awful time working on that thing then. And our final story of the day is by O2K30C1. New company commander requires soldiers to wear ties with civilian clothing while on tour. I was in a US Army band stationed in Germany in the early 90s. We performed a lot of concerts and events for the public all over the region, usually traveling by bus. Normally we would wear civilian clothing while traveling, then change into a formal military uniform after we arrived, unpacked, and set up for the event. Our normal requirement for civilian clothing was pretty informal, similar to what you might wear in an office for the US. Men had to wear a shirt with a collar, so lots of us wore polo shirts. Jeans were acceptable as long as they were clean and no holes, no hats, etc. I had been there about six months when we got a new company commander. In a band, the commander is a warrant officer and also conducts the band, runs rehearsals, picks music, all that fun stuff. He had been with the unit about two weeks and went along with us on a short two to three day tour to play some concerts for German civilians. When we returned, he started making changes. Most were pretty minor and expected, like what music would be performed, but the biggest change was to our travel dress code. 
All male soldiers would be required to wear a tie when on tour, never mind that many of these kids were rather young and didn't even own one, other than the flat black tie issued with our Class A uniforms. The next trip was only a few days away, and we had better show up ready to go with ties on. And that's when me and my roommate decided to have a little fun. We went to the local thrift shop and bought up all the ugly ties we could find. Paisley ties, Christmas ties, ties with Hawaiian hula girls on them, thin neon colored 80s ties, super wide 70s ties, even a few plaid bow ties. Over the next few days, we handed them out to nearly every person in the unit, including a few women who wanted to get in on the fun. Tour departure day arrives and we have our morning formation in the band hall, all standing in rows, dressed and ready to depart, new ties worn. The first sergeant is wearing a lovely hula girl tie, and grins a bit as he goes over all the usual formalities. Everyone present, all equipment ready to go, last minute instructions, blah blah blah, then calls the company commander in. The new commander steps inside the band hall and freezes. He looks slowly down the lines of soldiers, biting his lip, like he's trying very hard not to say something. He backs out of the room still not saying a word. About a minute later, he returns, looks right at the first sergeant, and says, Everything ready to go? Yes, sir. Right. Let's hit it. The tour went off without any problems, but the requirement to wear ties was dropped as soon as we got back. Some of us still wore them occasionally for fun. I think that although it was technically complying, I think it's cool of the commander to not have any issues with it. Obviously they had issues enough with it to remove the requirement after that, but they didn't stop and yell and force everybody to take their ties off and whatnot. They took it all in, they realized everybody was complying, although ridiculously, and decided to take action after they got done with what needed to get done. I need your long essay on a single page. Yes ma'am. When I was a college sophomore, we had this professor, Mrs. Wang, in religion studies, who would act like her subject should be our top priority. Although we came from different majors, religion studies is just a filler subject needed for students in this Catholic college. She wanted us to come every meeting because attendance is a part of her grade, which is fine by me, but she would give us too many research assignments for so little time. This class is a Tuesday to Thursday one, so if she gives us three research assignments on Tuesday, the outputs are expected to be submitted on Thursday the same week. This started a problem on all of us since we also have a lot of things to do from major subjects, but it would be a hassle to fail a subject like this. Retaking a major subject is acceptable. Retaking a filler subject is annoying. One Tuesday, she gave us an assignment a 4,000 word essay to be submitted on Thursday. 4,000 is a lot for us given the time frame, and that week was the week before midterms, so it gave us a hard time. But the catch, she wanted it on a single sheet of short bond paper, which is literally impossible to fit the 4,000 word essay. A classmate of mine, Nathan, asked Mrs. Wang about the single page thing. Nathan asked if we could submit multiple pages of the essay to accommodate the 4,000 word essay she was asking us. You are all stubborn. 4,000 word essay in a single page. That simple. Mrs. Wang was already in her early 60s that time, so I don't think she had an idea of what a compressed 4,000 word single page essay would look like when printed. In every subject, we have a Facebook group for announcements, discussions between classmates, and note sharing. In some subjects, the teacher was usually the admin of the group, but since Mrs. Wang is not too fond of Facebook, one of our classmates volunteered to create a group for us. The night before the submission, we were having a problem with our outputs. Some classmates who were done with the essay tried to print their outputs. The font was too small, even though the margin was already adjusted. Here comes the malicious compliance. Nathan, who was still a little pissed about the whole situation, posted a status on our group. Let's give her what she wants. 4,000 words in a single page. The comments were blowing up. Some commented that they were thinking of the same and others were laughing. That time, the ha 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 reaction button wasn't still a thing, so literal ha 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 were filling up the comments. The next day, we were all excited about our plan. One by one, we placed our papers on her table. 
As she was scanning on some papers, she went ballistic. Why are the words in these too small? Nathan raised his hand. Ma'am, you were clear about a 4,000 word essay on a single page. That's what it looks like. Mrs. Wang couldn't contain her anger. She realized she was wrong. She just told us to reprint our outputs and submit them on Tuesday next week. We all agreed. If you had to take a filler class like this, and you found out that this filler class has way more work than probably even your major classes, would you just accept it and give up and fail that class knowing you'd have to retake it later? Or would you try and suffer through it? Let me know in the comments down below. This next story is by throwaway8820202. Try not to think? All right, I won't. I signed up for a startup job that said they needed my skills earlier this year. During the interview, they advertised themselves as experienced businessmen trying something new, needing someone with my skills because they had no one with that kind of experience, open to changing as the market did. I said I wanted to learn more about some of the tangently related aspects of my field to grow, and they said it would be a good fit. So I took the job for two quarters of the year with a set exit point. A very important note, my pay was coming from a third party with interest in both the startup and development of people from my city. So while I was their employee, I was pretty explicitly there for the learning experience instead of the pay. This company was proposing a tech solution for restaurants. The pandemic hit and I started about two weeks later right as the racial tensions in the US reached their peak. I meet my new boss, excited to get started, and they let me know they made a last minute hire of a friend, part time, who's going to be my supervisor. I was paid for full time hours for a pretty demanding, constantly shifting environment, but my direct supervisor was only going to be working 15 hours a week. The person who hired me slash founder says that he'll be largely unavailable to me because of how busy he'll be, and I should refer to new supervisor instead. So there goes that learning environment I signed up for. Strike one. I meet with my new supervisor, and before literally anything else comes out of his mouth, I know things are pretty hard for you people right now, so just know that I understand if your work is lower quality than what it usually would be. Ah, uh, yes. Judging me by the color of my skin before you know literally anything else about me. Strike number two. Next meeting with supervisor and boss and they want to donate to Black Lives Matter. OP, can you write a report on what charities we should donate to? We think you'd know best. This has literally nothing to do with my job description and isn't even tangently related to our business. They're clearly only asking me because I was the only person of color at the company at that point. I asked if we had any black business owner partners and they said no. I told them, this is going to come off as tone deaf and we shouldn't do it. It has nothing to do with our product, our partners are literally all white men, and we're offering less than $500 in donations. It'd be better to try and invite some black business owners and focus on community development. They tell me to do it anyways and that it will be the only work for me during my first two weeks. Then, once I've written the report, a white accountant on the team says, This will come off as tone deaf and I don't think we should do it. So we don't. Strike three, you're out. But I'm a professional so I covered my bases before giving up. I speak with the program organizing third party and they tell me they can't switch my company. They give me some tips for fitting in better and I spend a few weeks doing literally anything they ask as well as I can. I get several weeks worth of work done in very little time, even doing side projects to try and show how capable I am at my job. I speak directly with my supervisor, comparing my current workload with previous jobs and stating explicitly that I feel I could be better utilized if they'd give me a chance. Showing my work to my sponsor, they start giving me side projects because they're impressed. But every time I turn in a project to the tech restaurant place, one of the co-founders, who, like me, worked his way up in the world, tells me how fantastic it is. That it meets every standard he has, and he's excited to show it to his partner. Once the boss sees it, he nitpicks it apart, saying it's not what he wanted. There were times he edited me in circles, having me change A to B, then B to C, then C to A, and asking why I didn't just do A in the first place. 
I try to explain why doing what he asks is against best practice or hurts our customers in a thousand different ways. Based on our board members' feedback when I was at the meetings, everyone but him is on the same page. But if it's not his idea, he hates it. And if it's from young black me, then he especially hates it. Finally, this tech restaurant business sits me down after the first quarter for a performance review. Unlike normal business, they didn't ask for any feedback for them, they just wanted to tell me that I was too opinionated, trying too hard, that I should try not to think so much about the work. So I do. I stop doing extra projects for them and start taking up more well-paid side gigs. Like, really well-paid. $50 an hour with performance bonuses is normal for my position, and this startup is throwing that away. Eventually, they have me write a single blog post every week instead of doing my job. I'm excluded from pretty much any meeting that wasn't contractually required. Their sales plummet as they stop pushing back against bad business practices, to the point that I started graphing it in an Excel spreadsheet. They went from ten grand a month to $200 a week, with several weeks with no sales. I'm getting forwarded customer complaints by the good founder, and my response is, Oh man, yeah, that seems like a problem. I could fix it, but you'll need to get permission from Direct Supervisor. Direct Supervisor slash Friend of the Bad Boss turns out to have way less time available than even the 15 hours and is almost never responding. When I tell him the good founder wants me to work on a project, he says that he doesn't think I can handle it and shouldn't worry about it. So I don't. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Second quarter over, and I remind the bad founder that I was leaving. I put together a folder of all of the things they'd need from me, as well as detailed instructions on how to move over permissions from my account. Instead of doing that, they just leave everything as is. Now 2020 is over. I've made good money this last quarter, working for the sponsor company and other contracts. My new jobs really appreciate all that I'm doing for them, and some of them even sent me Christmas presents. I still get phone notifications about the startup's weekly sales because they never turned them off, and it's gone down to two orders or less a week. What's especially funny to me is that the account sending me the notification is licensed at a pretty penny. So they're incompetent enough that they're paying extra money to update me every week. A couple of grand a year. Friend of a friend told me their potential investors pulled out after I left, since the bad boss thought he could do it all on his own. Several board members have jumped ship. There were only the two co-founders left once I headed out at the end of the second quarter. Even my old supervisor left. And their website says that's still the case they've stopped offering live support or refunds and started getting some pretty poor reviews from clients. I'll be surprised if they last. If they do, I'm sure they'll get a nice Twitter welcome in a few years once they try to hire another person of color, and they treat them with the racism they doled out to me. These people are just disrespectful, incompetent, racist. How many more checkboxes do you need to sign off before you just have no empathy at all for how terrible they're doing? How big of a hole into the ground they've dug themselves into? To be honest, I don't think they're gonna last either. And our final story of the day is by Lax Farmer Dan. Complain about me logging into my phone 30 seconds late? I'll work my hours but cost you money. My first job out of bar school was with an ambulance chasing firm. I work 12 to 8 p.m. in the call center calling people after accidents to get them to sign with us for a personal injury claim. Officially, this was not cold calling as the details were passed to us by insurance companies who assured us that each lead had confirmed injuries and asked to speak to a lawyer. I have my doubts over how truthful the insurers were after a number of people I called denied any injury or seemed surprised to be contacted by a solicitor's firm but that is not the cause of the story. I was very good at my job. Our target was for 10 new claims a day, so if you got a car with a driver and passenger in the front and three kids in the back, you were laughing, as that one call was half your quota. Many colleagues would go slow once they had their 10, but I kept busy. If nothing else, it was boring there when not working and time dragged, and would average about 25 new clients a day. After six months, we get a new manager in the call center. 
One of those micromanager types, which is a style I do not respond well to. I start getting emails saying things like, you were 30 seconds slash 1 minute and 23 seconds late logging into the system today, make sure you stay late by that much time. Now I should point out that up until now, I logged out at the end of my shift bang on time unless I was on a call, in which case I would finish it, and if this was a call with 5 people in, you could be stuck for another 45 minutes. We also had to turn the computers off at the end of the day. Easy, hit shut down and walk off, and turn them on at the start of our shift. The computers being slow, this could take 5 minutes before you could log into the call system. I responded to the first few emails pointing out that logging into the call system 30 seconds late meant I had actually turned the computer on, which was technically part of my job, about four and a half minutes before my shift started, and I stayed late regularly to finish calls. The manager told me that the time to turn on the computer was not part of my job, and I had to be ready to make calls bang on 12. I contacted HR and they reluctantly agreed that turning on the computer was one of our duties and therefore we only needed to be ready to press the power button at 12. New manager was not easily Ben though. He started buying the time we got to our desks and then, as is always the case when relying on public transport, if you were a few seconds or minutes late, he'd send the email telling you to work the extra time at the end of your shift. I decided that I had had enough of this, and so I decided to work to rule. I stopped trying to get new clients after hitting my 10 for the day, and would play on the internet unless getting an incoming call from someone responding to a voicemail. I wouldn't make any outgoing calls after hitting the daily target. I also decided that if I was on a call at 8pm, I would simply tell the potential client, my shift is now finished, hang up, and turn the computer off. I did this for a week and encouraged others to do it. When the weekly stats hit my boss's desk, he realized we were about a third down in terms of clients secured compared to other weeks. He called us into a meeting with his head of department and bollocked us all, asking why we were all lazy and not securing clients, screaming about us hanging up on clients. I just said, You told us you wanted us to work as required by the contract down to the second. That's all we're doing. Do you not like it? A few weeks later, he was gone and a much more sensible manager moved in. Things went back to the way they were. I ended up staying at the firm for 7 years, although only in the call center for 9 months before moving on to case handling and then trial work. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. For a company or a team that's operating flawlessly, the last thing you need is to introduce a micromanaging manager in. They're lucky the micromanaging didn't cause irreparable damage to the team. Could have done something that just totally threw off all the chemistry or made some people quit? Imagine coming in every day constantly late because of public transportation and constantly being ragged on and told you have to wait another extra minute and a half at the end of your shift because the bus was slightly late. It's a good thing it recovered. Clean enough, nosy Aunt Rosie? For a bit of background, my parents are a bit older than most parents are when having a child. I was adopted at the age of 5 weeks and at that time, my dad was 42 and my mom was 37. This is important to note because my dad is the youngest child in his family and his youngest sister, he was the only boy out of 4 kids, was 16 when he was born. So that being said, my aunts are all very old now and they aren't the friendly old lady types, sadly. They've always been greedy, nosy, and love to gossip and spread rumors about the in-laws of the family. My mom has gone through a lot of torture because of them, which is the case with this story. And now, so have my husband and I. Two of the three have gotten nicer over the past couple of years, but the middle sister, who is in her 80s now, I believe, has always been the worst and continues to be to this day. This story is about her. I'll call her Rosie, though I honestly don't care that much if she were to find out I wrote this. Still, I'd rather not risk that for my dad's sake, cause he'd never hear the end of it. I have many other stories about my three aunts, but this one came to mind recently. Rosie has, on multiple occasions, crept up to our kitchen window to peek in. 
Since that window is higher up due to the sink below it, she has always gone to that one, since it'd be harder for anyone to notice her peering in from below unless they were using the sink. More times than I can count, she scared the heck out of me while I was washing dishes. She's too old to do this now, but she would creep up and I'd usually catch her movement in my peripheral. I've broken a few dishes due to her window jump scares. Still, she topped that level of privacy invasion several times. Unbelievably, during a hurricane one year, she was so intent about seeing how badly my mom's flowers were damaged, she loves to rub that kind of thing in my mom's face just to get her upset, that she walked to our house and stood outside in the downpour and high winds. If I hadn't noticed her and my dad hadn't gone out to make her come inside, she would have been crushed by a pecan tree. Not five minutes after she came in, it fell across the spot she had been standing and onto our roof. Crazy, right? Well, instead of being shaken up by the fact that she came so close to death by tree, she was just amused and rubbed in the fact that our sunroom roof was freaked, as well as bringing up my mom's ruined flowers. Anyway, on to the story. Rosie is obsessive about cleanliness as well and our house was usually a bit messy when growing up. My dad worked long shifts, my mom had been diagnosed with MS and had battled cancer for three years on top of that, and though I did chores, I could only do so much more whilst going to school. Of course, Rosie would take any chance she could to come in and point out any mess, sometimes just letting herself in when she thought no one was home so she could later rub it in. She'd often insist on helping out just so she could go gossip to my dad's other sisters about how worthless my disabled mom was or talk about how lazy of a daughter I was. Unlike the other nieces and nephews in the family, she loves to speak poorly of me because I was adopted and now because I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm a Wiccan and a nerd who doesn't conform to the preppy, snobbish behavior that the rest of my cousins have. So, one day she came over and actually rang the doorbell instead of just waltzing in, and I answered the back door. At the time, I was probably 13 or 14 years old. She had brought us some home-cooked food, as she did quite a bit. That seems like a sweet gesture, but in reality she'd usually do it so that she could brag about what a good Christian she was and how she helped such a poor family. My dad had always tried to stay on good terms with her though, so I had been instructed to accept the food at the door while my mom napped and my dad was at work. It's important to note that my mom had just been diagnosed with MS a month or two before this incident. I made a bit of awkward small talk with Rosie and then was saying goodbye when she caught the door and stuck her head into our back porch. Just to clarify, it's a closed in porch. I was already angry with her that day, as it had come around to us earlier in the week that she had been telling people that my dad should just leave my mom because of her decline in health. So I felt my blood boil as I watched her silently survey the entire room with a look of disgust. She didn't speak for around a minute, just stood there staring at everything. Finally, she pulled her head back and looked at me. In the most condescending and disgustingly sweet voice she could muster, she said, OP, how about you clean this porch today? Now, I admit, the back porch was always the messiest room in the house. The far side of the room was cluttered with boxes that we didn't have proper storage space for, we would temporarily put trash bags by the door, and there was always quite a bit of dirt that constantly got tracked in from the garden several times a day. This particular day, we hadn't cleaned up the porch for about a couple of weeks, so it was worse than usual. Even still, I did not want her sticking her nose in our business and bossing me around in my own home, especially since I was helping take care of my mom too. I had a lot on my plate. It was on a Saturday and I just wanted to relax, and cleaning would have been the farthest thing from relaxation. I was stressed out and I wanted a day to just be a kid. I tried to smile and said, oh don't worry Aunt Rosie, I'll clean this up tomorrow. It wasn't a lie, I had already planned to clean the porch the next day, but I desperately wanted some time to myself to unwind before tackling the mess. Of course, she refused to listen to me. 
Oh, but wouldn't your dad feel so nice coming home tonight and seeing how clean it will be? Having to help your mama does take quite a toll on him with the amount of work he already does. It's not easy on him having a crippled wife. So it's your responsibility now to do most of the cleaning, right? She attempted to sound solemn as she spoke like that about my mother, too. Now she had pissed me off more. She knew how sensitive of a subject my mom's condition was, and she knew how badly I wished to make my dad happier with everything he had been taking on. And knowing that she had been telling everyone that my dad was suffering having to deal with my mom and that he should leave her, it was difficult to hold my temper and force myself to be polite. I somehow managed to calmly say, no, it's not easy on any of us, as you well know. With the way I said this, I made it clear to her that I knew what she'd been saying behind our backs. You're very right, it is my responsibility. I'll clean this up today then. Her expression briefly changed at my implication that I knew of her nasty gossip, but she continued on as if I hadn't called her out. She sticks her head in again and tuts at the mess. Oh no, this will take you several hours to properly clean on your own. How about I help later today? It'd be no trouble. This just must be cleaned up today. Now, I could barely endure a five-minute conversation with the woman, much less a couple of hours. Again, I told her that I'd handle it myself, but it was obvious that she wasn't going to back off, as she kept going on about everything that needed to be done. So I finally agreed, though I had already decided that she wasn't going to win this. She'd only go talk crap to the rest of the family if I actually had her help. And I knew that I would definitely snap if I had to be around her or hear her passive-aggressive comments about my mom for that long. She gave me a large, satisfied grin and told me she'd be back in three hours to help me. If she was so troubled by the mess in my house and wanted me to make it spotless ASAP, I'd happily do it right away, without her. After all, she said it was my responsibility, after all. This is so bizarre, I know, but I knew that if she were to come back to find I had already cleaned the porch without her now, she'd be furious. She wouldn't get to rub anything in. She'd be unable to hold it over our heads, and in her eyes, she'd have lost at her own petty game. I would be getting her back in a weird way for the things she had said about my parents. She was not going to freak with us over an untidy old porch. Before her insistence to help me, she had only said that I should tidy up, so I chose to comply with her original demand. As I type this out, I'm realizing more and more how ridiculous this was, but she's crazy as heck, and this really is something that she would be pissed about. So, as soon as the hag started her walk back home, I jumped into action, letting my anger fuel me. My mom stopped me for a moment as I passed by her lying on the couch. She asked me what was going on, and I explained the situation to her. She was pissed that Rosie was, yet again, sticking her nose where it didn't belong. My mom had been so upset by Aunt Rosie's gossip, and I knew she did not want to see her, but I asked her if she could possibly answer the door when Rosie came back. My mom hesitated, but finally nodded, saying she would like to see the look on the old witch's face. So, for the next two hours, I cleaned as fast as I possibly could, making sure not to leave a spot of dust or dirt. I was already worn out that day from helping my mom out so much after school each day. I was straining myself from running around so much when I finally finished, but I didn't care. I had been scared that Rosie would show up before I was done, so I was just smug that I had beat her. Now I just had to wait. Right on time, Rosie rings the doorbell an hour later. There's a little set of windows looking out onto the porch from the kitchen, so I quickly hid by them so I could discreetly peek out at her at an angle where she wouldn't be able to see me. My mom took a deep breath to calm her nerves, grabbed her cane, and went to answer the door. I had told her what to say ahead of time if she was asked where I was. The conversation went something like this. Hello Rosie, what brings you back by today? Rosie is silent for a long while and I take a peek out to see her leaning forward into the porch, 
Her mouth is agape and she's looking the entire room over with angry wide eyes. She has a very distinct tone to her voice when she's pissed and she couldn't hide it when she finally responded. I ducked back down and just listened. Well, OP and I were supposed to clean this porch up together today. Mom in a very innocent voice. Oh, well, she seems to have already done it. I can see that, irritated Sai. I offered my help, but I guess my help isn't wanted. I'm sorry you feel that way. I think she just wanted to get it done quickly since it's Saturday and she had plans later. I had no such plans. And you did tell her that she should do it today, right? It was her responsibility, right? Rosie stutters a bit. Well, yes, but then I told her I'd be back over to help out. She said nothing to me about having plans. I walked all the way back over here to help. I'm sorry, Rosie, but she did say she could do it on her own, didn't she? Yes, but I thought y'all would appreciate my help. I thought she would appreciate my help. Where is she at now, huh? I'd like to speak to her. She's taking a shower right now. She was going to help me clean this up tomorrow anyway, but since you insisted she do it today, I guess she did as you told her to. She's old enough now to do this on her own anyway, but we all do appreciate everything that you do for us, Rosie. Well, yes, but I... Oh, and thank you for the food earlier, by the way. Oh, yes, you're well. Mom in an overly exhausted voice cuts Rosie off. I'm so sorry, but I need to go sit down because I'm crippled, as you know. But thank you for your offer. We appreciate the thoughtfulness. Have a good day, Rosie. Rosie began to say something, but then quickly realized that my mom was closing the door on her. So she muttered a strained, you too, and the door closed in her face. My mom came back in, and we quietly stood there until we could see Rosie stomping home in a huff. And then we looked at each other and burst out laughing. I know this is a very strange malicious compliance slash petty revenge, but with someone like Rosie, it really ruffled her feathers. She told my dad later that she was disappointed in me, which only made me laugh more. She didn't come back over for about a month, which was an even bigger bonus for us. It felt so good to stand up to her like that, even though it wasn't direct, and it cheered my mom up too. So, in a tough situation like this where, in this case, OP's father was the brother of the offending person here, when they don't want to cut family members off who are still being obviously disgusting to them and their family members, do you try and make it work or do you cut them off yourself? Let me know in the comments down below because I'm kind of curious what most people think is the right way to handle this. Our next story is by throwaway191407. You want the house? Okay, good luck at the renovation. This happened in the year 2015. This is the long story short of the already long story. My grandmother on my father's side died in 2007, bless her soul. She owned a house and lot, a bungalow type, near the sea. This house wasn't paid in full and there's still a remaining balance of about 5200 in US dollars. This is already big money for us. Because my father is the only son, his older sisters agreed he should get the house. There was no will, but he should pay the remaining balance. We lived there and renovated the house. My father did almost 75% of the work. He added two bedrooms, ceiling, furniture, added another bathroom, tiled the floors, kitchen sink, and septic tank. No drainage system on that location. Basically, we received the house in bare shape. We paid fully in 2015, but we didn't receive the title. There was so many excuses. 2016 comes, his nephew, a retired commander, visited my parents and told my father that he wants to add a second floor, so he and his wife could live there also. My father didn't agree and he called his older sister if they want that to happen. They just said that they don't want to get involved. His nephew showed him that he already had the title of the house. Don't know how he did that, maybe he used his political background, I'm not sure. My father was furious. He called me and told me what happened. By that time, I already bought a small patch of land for them when they want to retire, but I'm still saving enough money to build a house suitable for their needs. There were court battles that I will not include, but in the end, his nephew won. But there was an agreement that he has to pay my father $7,400. He mailed us the contract that we should vacate the house after six months. 
and there was a specific item that our lawyer pointed out. A. We should repaint the house, no specific color. B. Leave the house in original state. Guess what? We hired a construction team to demolish the bedroom, the bathroom, remove the ceiling, kitchen sink, tiled floor, and also the septic tank, leaving it in original state. We spent about $2,800 including the labor. The cherry on top? We painted the house with black inside and red outside with violet dots. It was a huge eyesore. I was bombarded with lots of calls and messages from my aunts and cousin, which I didn't reply. We went no contact after that. My parents now live in a beautiful farmhouse tending their small garden. They enjoy morning walks by the lake, just living a stress-free environment. They are planning to adopt a puppy next month. Obviously, it seems like there was some kind of shady long con thing going on here with the ants involving the inheritance. Well, we wouldn't want to get involved when it seems probably pretty clear that they were involved to begin with. Good on them for just ripping out every last thing that they installed to that place. That nephew doesn't deserve it. I hope he enjoys his bare bones house with all the money he doesn't have after he had to pay OP's father to move out. They got the house, but they didn't get nearly anything that they were trying to cheat OP's father out of. And that's extremely satisfying. Want me to move something without tying it down first? You sure? Okay then. Meet Bob. Bob is someone I know. Bob is a great guy. He has worked hard to support his family his whole life. I admire Bob because he can fix a lot of things on his cars, house, etc. He is almost entirely self-taught and has a lot of common sense despite not being book smart, which is why I was astounded that he had me do this. Bob can also be stubborn as all heck and gets to be a real tick when he's stubborn. Bob's wife found a beautiful world top desk at a yard sale. She had wanted one for years. Bob asked me to drive to the yard sale with my pickup. Sure thing, Bob. I don't mind helping you out a bit. Bob's wife was excited. Her eyes were gleaming. It was huge, heavy as freak, somewhere around 250 pounds, and old. It was also a very nice desk. So Bob and I in the cellar get it manhandled into my pickup bed. I grab straps and Bob snaps at me. We don't have time for that. Let's get it back to the house. I know darn well it isn't going to hold still and I tell him so. Yes, it will. It is a big heavy desk. Drive really slowly with your hazards on. Now me, who actually paid attention to physics in high school, and you, dear readers, know where this is going. I protested. Let's lay it down or strap it. Bob overruled me. Bob's wife said something. No, he didn't want the desk marred up by straps. I said something again. Bob got pissed and yelled, Freak the straps, let's go, just drive like I said. I said freak it. I did exactly what he said, despite it being my truck. After all, Bob has done a lot of free work on my pickup for me. I was doing him a favor, so whatever. Let him be stubborn. We left the yard sale at 10 miles per hour, with a dozen or so people staring after us, slack-jawed. Bob and his wife were in their Corvette behind me. So I was doing exactly what he said, driving really slowly with my hazard lights blinking. We make it the few blocks to the main drag that will take us most of the way to Bob's house. I get in the turn lane to wait. The desk starts to shift. The turn lane turns green and I edge out at about 5 to 7 miles per hour. The top heavy desk tilted, started to shift, then the wheels on one side came up. Nothing you do at that point is going to work to stop it from tilting. Physics wins again. Bob's wife's new desk died a horrible death in the middle of Powers Boulevard in Colorado Springs one warm spring day in 1993. I could hear her wailing through the open window. Rest in peace, desk. Sorry, Bob's wife. I wanted you to have that thing. You were so happy. If you were OP and you had this thing loaded up in the back of your pickup truck, would you have demanded that the thing get strapped down in the back of your pickup? before you started driving around with a loose desk? Or would you let Bob succeed in being stubborn and let them deal with the consequences of their actions? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Space Night Life, called the police over a burger. I will try to sum this up the best I can so it isn't long. 
I got off work at about 11.48 p.m. on New Year's Eve, went on a really long date that ended sad, and went to get dinner at 4.20. I ordered a burger at a burger place over their app and paid for it that way, so it would be done when I got there. I get there and the woman is very confused. The manager is brought over and he laughs in my face saying, Well, your problem is that we're selling breakfast. I told them about how the app, website, and Google says differently and they didn't care. I sighed and asked for a refund, which the woman said, Nope, can't refund, sorry. After some back and forth, I said, Fine, then I'll call the police. She replied back with, Do it. Now, I wouldn't call the police over a cheeseburger, but mine had bacon. I called the non-emergency number, and a police car came over, then another. When they pulled up, I realized I just called the police over a dang hamburger. End result, I basically got a slip to come back anytime the next day for free lunch, which I just finished eating. If you place the order and they can't fulfill that order, why wouldn't you be able to get any kind of refund? They're just trying to steal money from you. Calling the cops is probably a bit over the top, but hey, if they're literally trying to steal from you, you gotta do what you gotta do. This next story is by Shiny Arrow. You just want cash for Secret Santa? Hope you like coins! Every year, our family does Secret Santa between our extended family to save on costs. It's an Australian $50 limit, but we like to wrap things up all nice and get really meaningful gifts. We use an online portal and everyone enters their preferences so you can buy something good. Unfortunately, my brother-in-law didn't really take it seriously this year, not for the first time, and literally just wrote cash in his gift preferences. My wife drew him for Secret Santa, so we put our heads together to think of a creative way to maliciously comply with his request. 1. We purchased a 1 foot tall Christmas tree. 2. We went to the bank and got $50 in assorted coins. 3. We then wrapped small bundles of 1-3 to three coins in bright wrapping paper, then taped them so they were impregnable, safe, and secure. 4. We twisted paper clips, gold ones, super festive, and taped them to the bundles so they could be hung on the tree as decorations. 5. We covered the tree in wrapped coins. In all, there were 38 bundles. Fast forward to opening the presents, my brother-in-law looked confused as he received a small Christmas tree wrapped in clear plastic. The card had a picture of a little money tree on it, but we still had to explain that he needed to unwrap the tree and check the decorations. He soon realized the scale of the task that was in front of him, and he press-ganged the six children present into opening the wrapped money. We all had a laugh about it, and the kids had a heap of fun opening all the little money parcels. Money tree, plastic, paper, and metal, 2020. The attached image here of the tree, it looks like a pretty creative and fun way to deal with this. I was thinking it was just going to be $50 worth of the equivalent of pennies, which is just one cent. Just like a sack of 5,000 coins. But I like this one a lot better, and the kids got to join in on the fun too, so an even bigger plus. Our next story is by PiratesFan02. Want me to clean a bin of balls? How about you do it instead? About 15 years ago, I worked at a green hardware store in the Midwest US that helps you save big money. I had just graduated college and was going to be leaving in a few weeks to start my new job as a teacher. My manager and I got along really well, but he didn't like that I was leaving soon. We had this huge bin of inflated balls that were obviously dirty. Nobody wanted to clean them and it was going to take a long time. Note, when working in a school, you need to take a training on cleaning up blood, bloodborne pathogens. In many schools, the teacher cleans it up. The bloodborne pathogen training at this place of work said that you contact your manager to clean it up. I start to take out the 30 plus balls to clean them and the bin when I see an old bloody band-aid. I go to my manager and say that I can't clean the balls because of the bloody band-aid and how I'm supposed to report it to my manager to have them clean it up. He tells me to get gloves and clean it up as he knows that I had the pathogen training for being a teacher. Cue malicious compliance. With a big smile on my face, I told him I didn't want to go against company policy, so I can't clean it up. I also said that I don't know which balls came in contact with the band-aid, so I won't be able to clean them up either. 
He was pissed knowing there was nothing he could do but clean the whole thing up. He got the last laugh a few days later, but that's another story. He was a great manager and a great guy. How the turntables. The job nobody wanted to do had to be done by only the manager in the end. At least OP and the manager were on good terms. Our next story is by The Real Borkus, an unlocked bank. So I've waited to post this for a while until the security issue was resolved so as not to create a safety concern. I worked as a bank supervisor at a fairly large national bank chain for a little over two years. This bank is super crappy to their employees and very penny pinching on the backside, since they spend all their play money on trying to get people in the door to open accounts. I was in charge of opening and closing the bank each day, making sure things were locked, alarms activated, money counted and correct, etc. One day, in my normal closing duties as I'm leaving, I go to lock the front door behind me. But the entire lock falls completely out of the door. Obviously, I call my boss and let him know. He is upset that I'm calling him after business hours and just tells me to put it back in and lock it. Cue malicious compliance. I have no idea how to do that, so I literally just lock the lock and set it gently and precariously in its spot and leave leaving the bank unlocked. I come back in the morning and give my boss a call during business hours to get his approval to get our locksmith out. He tells me it's expensive to call the lock company, so just not to. I send him an email to get written, documented evidence of this decision and just let my employees know what's going on so when we get robbed, they are aware whose fault it is. I continue leaving the bank unlocked for six months. Eventually, we have an issue with our main vault lock as well, in which it stops locking because the electronics have failed. I report this to my boss, reminding him that the front door to the bank still does not have a functional lock. He says he'll submit the request. A week passes and I've heard nothing. So I reach back out and he says, quote, it will get fixed when it gets fixed. I quit working there after two more months of leaving all the money unlocked and the front door unlocked. My employees followed, as none of us want to be responsible for the impending massive robbery. I recently found out from a coworker that I keep in contact with from a sister branch that it was not fixed for another six months after I left, when the security audit came up. My boss was fired, citing massive security concerns, but somehow no one burglarized it in that time. Maybe not the most climactic ending, but it's just mind-blowing to me that we left a bank unlocked for over a year and no one really gave a crap. In this case, wouldn't you just want to go above the boss's head and try and file some kind of report to some kind of higher-up authority in this company? Even if it was an anonymous tip? That seems like a lot of liability you're leaving yourself open to. I don't think I would do that. It would probably make me nervous, but like, it would be better than leaving the bank unlocked for over a year. And our final story of the day is by Glittering Refuse 661 You want to save money by reducing redundancy in our server infrastructure? You got it. It was in the 1990s when I worked for a software company in Germany. They developed telephone billing systems for major European carriers. The IT infrastructure was based on Windows NT 4.0 workstation and server. Each server had a redundant counterpart to ensure a functioning network all the time. Name a server type and I am sure we had it and always in a redundancy. One day, when I was working in the air-conditioned room for the servers, I saw that the primary domain controller had some problems with the hard drives. It seemed that the SCSI controller was about to give up, and the database server wasn't in better shape. Immediately, I informed the CIO about it and ordered the needed parts. So far so good, until the CEO and CFO cancelled the order and demanded that every redundant server needs to be de-installed. I tried to tell them that the current structure is needed and demanded by the major shareholder. And to add insult to injury, I explained to them that cancelling the order for urgently needed hardware components to keep the whole network running is irresponsible. Both looked at me like Snape would sneer at Harry Potter and ignored my arguments. They ordered me to do as demanded. I thought to myself, 
Okay, they want me to sabotage the company, then they will get what they want. To cover my bases, I asked for a written order, which was given to me within an hour. I made three copies of it and sent the original one to the CIO and to the HR together with my resignation and asking to have my overtime be converted to free days. When the OK came, I started to do as requested even when I knew that the whole thing will end in a disaster. Every redundant server was shut down, the hard drives formatted, and the devices were returned to the storage facility. At the end of the day, I said my goodbye to my co-workers and left to never return. I knew what would happen within a week or two, but I didn't care anymore. I had been put through so much at this company that I was glad to have quit my job. A few of my co-workers had become good friends and we still have a good connection and help each other out once in a while. Well, a few days later, I got a frantic call from the CIO because the whole network was down and nothing was working. The PDC crashed spectacularly and the database server had followed right after. My reply was, sorry, but I don't work for you guys anymore and I am on vacation. Good luck and goodbye. I complied with the request made by the upper echelon of the company while maliciously wishing them to be chewed by the major shareholder, which then happened and the company went down pretty fast. And this is why you leave servers and infrastructure up to the guys that actually deal with servers and infrastructure. When people at the very tippy top start getting their hands too involved in what you should and shouldn't do, and overriding orders from an experienced professional, most of the time they're going to find themselves in very hot water. It was so bad that OP said, okay, screw this, I'm out, have fun with the mess. And have fun, it sounds like they did. Cold hard cash? Sure thing. Prefacing this with the information that 1. My grandma has too much money. 2. My grandma has too much time. 3. My grandma has too big of a freezer. And 4. My grandma is petty as freak. The story. I have a cousin who's always wanted all sorts of interesting things for his birthday. Grandma loved that. Absolutely freaking adored it. She gave me a blow in the butt turtle ocarina once and I love it. That should explain her gifting for you. Now, as he grew up, he was less and less inclined to entertain grandma's whimsical ideas and started requesting more mainstream presents. Grandma hated that and still found ways to make them whimsical. You want a guitar? Okay, but it'll have hippie wood burning patterns on it. You want bed sheets? Sure thing, but they'll have tie-dye prints all over and be made of silk. If it was possible to make a gift whimsical, grandma would do it. We all knew this and started getting awfully specific in what we requested until one year he threw his hands up and said, I don't know, just give me cold hard cash. Bad move. Very bad move. Grandma has chest freezers. The kind that are 4 feet deep, 4 feet across, and 12 feet long. Grandma also lives on a little foresty cottage plot, which means Grandma has access to all sorts of gardening tools and tinkers. So, Grandma being Grandma found a big bucket, a freak ton of little plastic seed bags, and got to work. Cousin, of course, was very excited to finally get a normal gift, and was grinning at Grandma thinking that he had finally won the game. That is, until Grandma brought out a 2 foot by 2 foot by 2 foot squared ice cube full of cash. Edited to add, measurement might be off. She used some sort of gardening bucket, and I was very young when it happened. This story's been retold by Grandma so many times that I don't think she remembers the exact measurements either. It wasn't frozen together either. Oh no. Grandma had gotten creative and layered the freaking ice gradually, freezing the cash solidly through the cube. This thing was icy white and oozing when brought into the room, and Grandma proudly announced that since he wanted cold hard cash, she gave him exactly that. This madwoman froze the equivalent of a thousand dollars in the ice in mixed money. There were tiny coins and bigger coins and bills and little seed bags near the center. It took the block about a week to melt because my cousin's birthday is in January and his mother refused to let it melt in the house for the fear of water damage. So it was sat in their garage slowly melting. Edited to add, bathtubs aren't common where I'm from and they didn't have one. Added two, it wasn't my block to melt, and I'm not sure why Cousin and Co. didn't put it in a shower. 
Moral of the story, don't freak with grandma and her whimsical presence. All things considered, would you be too upset about getting a giant ice cube filled with a thousand dollars knowing you just have to let it melt out somewhere? Let me know in the comments down below if you'd be ecstatic to get an ice block filled with a thousand dollars for your birthday. Our next story is by Drua Chain. Keep it red. Short and sweet, and probably not as cool as most ones on here, but everyone involved thought it was hilarious. I was playing Uno the other night with my wife and brother. We'd been playing for a few hours at this point and having an absolute blast. As most long Uno sessions go, there have been multiple alliances, all broken, all re-established, and betrayed yet again. In this particular round, my wife and brother were at each other's throats, just really doing everything they could to hurt each other. Insults were flying, the sheer number of reverse cards that were played honestly defied physics, and there I was caught in the crossfire. Two superpowers at war, and I'm the third world country caught in the middle. Then the fateful moment happens. She slaps down a red four and triumphantly announces, UNO! My brother seethed. He could not allow her to win. It's my turn, and he looks at me and says, keep it red. Now see, here's the problem. Before my wife Unoed, I'd been sitting on two skip cards for a while and I was itching to play them. So when my brother indicated he was going to hurt her, using red, all I heard was red. And I happened to have a red skip. So I slapped that crap down so hard the table quaked. Boys, the utter disbelief on both my wife's and brother's face is a look I'll cherish till the day I die. It was in slow motion that my wife laid down her last card, which was a red 7. We laughed for a solid 5 minutes after that. That malicious compliance is still being muttered about at my house and in any group chat that contains me and my brother. It was a glorious day, 11 out of 10 would keep it red again. Honestly, whether it's as kids or adults, those moments playing games with siblings and people that are close to you, loved ones, those can be some of the best and most long-lasting memories and something that when you get together with them again or you talk to them after a while, you can bring up and kind of rub in their face or jab them a little bit with. It's always a great time. This next story is by Scarlet Absol 13 you want me to run a fundraiser I tried to tell you I wouldn't be able to? Okay, have it your way. This is kind of a two-for-one malicious compliance story, so it's gonna be kind of long. So this happened back in September of 2006 when I was 16 years old. I was a Girl Scout, and our troop leader basically ran the troop like it was a doctoral-level university course and made us, girls aged from 12 to 16, run most of the fundraisers to teach us responsibility. Well, in September, we were going to be selling steeply discounted magazine subscriptions through the organization as a last-ditch effort to earn money for a trip to London the troop would be going on in April of 2007. I had no intention of participating in the fundraiser since I knew I wasn't going to be able to sell any magazine subscriptions, nor would I be going on the London trip. However, the leader had other ideas and put me in charge of the fundraiser, meaning I would be responsible for handing out the packets to the three girls who weren't at the meeting, and I would have to tally up all the sales at the end of the fundraiser. I immediately protested the decision by our militant leader and told her, I won't be able to run the fundraiser as I have academic obligations on our meeting night for the entire duration of the fundraiser. The leader sneered at me and said, What academic obligations could you possibly have for the next five Friday nights? I say, I'm in my high school's concert band and, weather permitting, we're scheduled to play at our school's soccer and or football games. Each of the performances count as a full test grade and missing just one performance will dock my grade a full letter. She sneered again and told me, An extracurricular activity like band isn't an academic obligation. I say, but ma'am, for me, concert band is an actual class, like math or science, and I get graded for it. And I'm going to be studying music in college, so... The leader says, I don't care, you're still going to run the fundraiser. 
A few of the other girls offered to run the fundraiser instead, but the leader was adamant that I would be the one running the fundraiser and she snapped. No, she needs to step up and take some responsibility for a change, even if she's not coming to London with us. So, cue malicious compliance number one. I reluctantly agreed to run the fundraiser, and as luck should have it, the weather was perfect and clear for those next five Friday nights, so instead of going to my Girl Scout meetings, I was sitting in the stands of my high school's football field jamming with the rest of the high school band. The night I went back to my Girl Scout meetings was the night I was supposed to turn in all the paperwork for the fundraiser as it was due the following Monday. And well, I had nothing to turn in and my leader was furious with me. In front of everyone and a few of the parents, she screamed, thanks to you the fundraiser failed. And I reminded her, when you put me in charge, I told you I wasn't going to be able to run it because of school obligations and you still decided to put me in charge. So I did the responsible thing and put my academics before my extracurricular activities. This fundraiser didn't fail because of me, it failed because of you. After that, she looked like she took a bite out of a lemon handed me her cell phone and said, Call your mother to come pick you up. You're no longer a member of this troop. I'll change your status to Juliet, a Girl Scout who isn't a member of a troop, when I get home tonight. Before I left, she sarcastically sneered, Good luck trying to find another troop to join. Cue malicious compliance number two. After school the following Monday, I called the Girl Scout Council office from my region and asked if there were any cadets slash senior troops in the county I lived in, and as it turned out, there was actually one in my hometown. I requested the leader's contact information and called her as soon as I got off the phone with the council office. I explained my situation to her and if it would be alright if I joined her troop. She said, of course, and gave me the troop number and troop crest. So later that week, I went to the Girl Scout Council store to pick up my new troop's insignia, and that Friday night joined my new troop, but it doesn't end there. Before I left that first meeting, my new leaders asked my mother if I wanted to join them for a Girl Scout seminar that was going to be held the next morning at a local hotel. I agreed to go, and the leader added, just so you know, your last troop leader is going to be there, is that okay? I don't know if you want to see her so soon after what happened. I grinned and said, oh, I definitely want to see her. The aftermath that ensued that sunny but chilly Saturday morning was glorious. Once my troop leaders, the other two girls from my troop, and I arrived at the venue, we were led to a room where my former troop leader, her daughter, and another girl from my former troop were in. Turns out they were also participating in the opening flag ceremony. The look on the leader's face when I entered the room wearing the full insignia for another cadet slash senior troop just a week after she kicked me out of her troop was priceless. She stiffly said to Kurt, hello, while the other two girls were like, we're so glad you were able to join a new troop and none of us blame you for what happened with the fundraiser. And to top it all off, Guess who ended up leading the opening flag ceremony because she was the highest ranking girl taking part? Yup, yours truly. OP knows what's good for them, what the right thing to do is, and what their self-worth is. I'm glad that OP stood up for themselves and didn't cave into the pressure of this troop leader. Be the bigger person and absolutely show them up and make them eat their words and actions. Our next story is by Joseph Forth we still wanted pizza. This took place in the very late 80s or early 90s pre-internet. We had a very large multi-line BBS system with some text games and robust chat rooms where a lot of people hung out and used it as the central hub of their social lives. A lot of us met and hung out in person on weekends and there were also a lot of parties. And that's already more backstory than you need but apparently forum rules say I have to include some sort of setup. One Saturday, we have a pool party that was pretty large. We decided to go order pizza from a local 24-hour place that was famous for having great brick oven square pizza. We ordered something like 10 to 12 large pizzas very early on, even confirming they are okay handling an order that big. 
hours go by, several phone calls asking where the pizzas are, excuses about how they had messed them all up, really all of them, and had to start over, but eventually, more than 8 hours after we ordered, they show up. Most of the people had left by then, and that was now way too many pizzas. We ask if we can just take half of them. The delivery guy, who I'll call delivery guy because I don't know his name and it isn't important, but again, form rules say I have to give somebody an alias during the story, says he has to call his boss. He comes in and uses the phone. I hear him telling his boss how after all those hours people have left and that we only want half the order. Boss says, no, tell him it is all or none. Fine then, none it is. Sorry dude, bye. There we are, we are starving. Some ideas are thrown out about what place was open on that side of town, where we could go, etc. I had my heart set on that pizza place, so I suggested we go there. There was some confusion at the suggestion, haha yeah that would be hilarious if we all just rolled up and… wait, you're serious? I was serious, but nobody was calling me Shirley. We went. As we are piling in, the delivery guy spots us and whispers to his boss while pointing at us. Boss gave us the evil eye the entire time we were in there, and I heard him say something about throwing all those other pizzas out. To be fair, if you totally screwed up the entire order all those pizzas and you showed up 8 hours late, I would think you have every right to deny the pizzas no matter how big an order. And our final story of the day is by California Old Timer. Private tells the drill sergeant why he wants to be in the Navy, as do many others. Okay, so this happened in basic Navy training in 1956. Basically, when you get there, you have the drill sergeant that is pressuring you and making you as uncomfortable as possible. A day passes and drill sergeant Sirius would make people do sit-ups, push-ups, and other physical exercises. The one question that he would ask repeatedly is, Why do you want to join this Navy? Some people said things about serving the country or bettering themselves. But then Private Honest gave his answer. Drill Sergeant Sirius said, Private Honest, why do you want to join this Navy? Private Honest says, Because there were no jobs in my town, sir. I didn't want my daughter and wife to be hungry and homeless, sir. Drill Sergeant Sirius looks embarrassed and continues down the line. He goes to Private Honest number two. Private Honest number two, why do you want to join this Navy? I was drafted, sir. I don't want to be in the Navy, sir. I am here against my will, sir. Drill Sergeant Sirius looks upset and continues down the line to Private Honest 3. Private Honest 3, why do you want to join this Navy? I don't want to, sir. I was drafted, sir. I had a good job in life at home, sir. I don't want to be here, sir. After this, the Drill Sergeant got frustrated and never asked that question for the rest of basic training because I'm sure that he feared people telling him the reasons why they wanted to be there or why people didn't want to be. First, let me say that the reason why I used army terms and titles instead of navy ones is that I thought it would be easier for people to relate to, as many are more familiar with the army. And to be spared of navy jokes, which I have heard many of. Also, years ago we did say drill instructor. Company instructor, the RDC term, wasn't widely used when I was there and started to be somewhat used by the time I left in the 60s. My hat's off to all the people that had to serve being drafted. People had to basically give up their lives just because the country said, you, you're going to war. I just could never imagine that would ever be an easy thing on anyone. You don't need help? Okay, just make sure you roll out of the way of the go-karts. This is a relatively short story from the time I worked at a go-kart track for a summer to earn some extra cash. Me and my friends all decided to work there, but didn't realize how crazy it was going to be. Every single day there was a massive issue where someone was either fired or chewed out by the owner. Let's call him Greg. Now, it's important to note for this story that Greg wasn't in the best shape. He was larger than life, so to speak. But despite this, he would be trying to help every day on the track, more likely than not causing problems that would have easily have been avoided. The micromanaging was brutal, and when he wasn't physically there, he would send us a lengthy email at the end of the day telling us what we did wrong after watching the cameras on the track. Now, Greg also had an attitude of, he can do no wrong, and also, he doesn't need help from nobody. 
which led to some awkward situations with customers, especially when they were upset. More likely than not, myself or the other employees had to apologize to customers daily when he would raise their voices at them for not wearing their helmet correctly, and if we ever mentioned it, he would then turn on us and begin to chew us out for doubting his actions. So one of our responsibilities is standing around the track with a stop sign with the word slow on it to wave at drivers who are going too fast and driving recklessly. The vehicles were too loud to simply yell at them. The track was pretty bendy, but part of it zoomed right by Greg's office, where he always kept a sign handy in case he thought a driver needed to slow way down. It was one of those days and a driver was zooming and bumping against other drivers and the walls. So Greg thunders out of the office, grabs his sign and waved it in front of the driver in question, who proceeds to whiz right past him. He goes around again. Greg more aggressively shakes the sign of the driver, who once again ignored him and kept going. This did not please Greg. Finally, Greg uses all his might and really shakes the sign in front of the driver's face, but unfortunately loses his balance and falls onto the track. We rush over to him and ask if he needs help, which he replies with in his usual angry bellow, I'm fine, leave me. Now, normally, for any other person, we could have stopped the traffic and given him a hand regardless, but this was Greg, and he was very clear that he was fine and we should leave him. But despite that, he was still on the ground, rolling around and unsuccessfully getting upright from his prone position. I suddenly get an amazing idea. I grab some spare orange traffic cones and put them around him on the track to make sure the carts didn't get close. It was all I could really do while following his instructions. Only until about 10 minutes later when all the go-karts had pulled off the track was when Greg managed to get himself upright. But by then we had already all busted a gut laughing. I'll truly never forget seeing him squirming mere inches from carts while refusing help. It was a sight to see. So if your boss was an absolute jerk and even in that moment when they're on the ground and they can't get up and there's carts whizzing by, they decide somehow that their ego is so big that they would still refuse help, would you comply with that or would you feel a bit too concerned for their safety involving the carts and get them up? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Jay Fletch 1305 you only get paid for 37 and a half hours work. Okay, I'll only stay for that long. So I worked as an executive pastry chef for a medium-sized hotel here in England where we catered mainly to weddings at weekends but had a successful restaurant that ran alongside it doing two-thirds rosette quality food. About 60 covers a night. Well, as anybody who has worked in catering may know, it's not uncommon to work a tremendous amount of hours in a week on a consistent basis. Here I was working about 75 to 80 ish hours a week, 5 days of about 14 or 15 hours, then an extra 5 or 6 or so on my day off. Now it's important to know that we did not get paid for overtime here as chefs. You worked all of these hours and you got paid for 37 and a half hours. That's 40 hours in work where they took 30 minutes off for 5 days for a lunch break that you never ever had. You do all this and life sucks doing it, but it's a job and it's not easy in catering at the best of times. So the straw that broke the camel's back comes when I get pulled by the finance manager because I left on one of those days after 5 hours. You see, they ran their weeks Thursday to Wednesday for pay and rota, etc. I left on a Thursday to go look after a family member on my day off that I'd already gone into work to help out on. But because it was a Thursday and the start of the week, I hadn't done enough hours in that week to justify leaving early. Me explaining that it was one, my day off really, two, I had worked 45 hours between Monday to Wednesday, and three, I didn't get paid for any extra work didn't seem to help. They got annoyed and said, you get paid for 37 and a half hours, no more. If you can't do your work in that time, then that's your problem, but you get paid no extra. Well, that played right into my hands. See, I mentioned above they had weddings at weekends and a busy restaurant that we used to have to service at the same time. If that sounds stupid and almost impossible, that's because it was. 
Well, the Saturday the following week was a big weekend for them. Bank holiday, big wedding, full restaurant, etc. So, me and two of the other chefs decided we would work the 37 and a half paid hours, then leave. So we worked Thursday and Friday racking up 31 paid hours there. Then Saturday, we all had the full day shift, breakfast through till close. So we started at 6 a.m. and then 2 p.m. rolls around. Well, that's our eight paid hours, so we left. We just simply downed tools, got changed and walked out, left the kitchen as it was, left the food prep where it was, didn't finish prepping for the night, we did nothing. Five minutes later, I get a very angry call from the general manager who wanted me back there immediately to work the shift and finish the wedding, etc., or they couldn't do it without me. I politely explained I was told to only work my 37 and a half hours or it wasn't my issue, so that's what I did. The night was a disaster by all accounts and it cost the company thousands in compensation to the wedding party and in lost revenue from the restaurant, never mind the reputational damage. Didn't go back into work until the following Thursday when my weekly hours started again. I got to keep my job. Not easy to replace a pastry chef of my skill who ran the kitchen for them most of the time. One of the others got sacked as he was easily replaced and the other got his hours cut until he quit. Catering is not a nice place to work. They're real jerks. Ultimately, I left about six months later. I got fed up of working for free as it had gone just back to normal. Left being owed about 20,000 British pounds of overtime that I never got. Company went bankrupt, dodgily, and destroyed all evidence of hours worked, employment records, etc. So we got screwed. The same guy rebought the hotel under a new name, etc. So it's all very shady. Honestly, if I was working a job like that, and the first week rolls along where they're expecting me to work more than double the actual paid amount of hours for free, I'd be looking to get out of there ASAP. This next story is by Addy the Ace. Crappy manager calls me in despite flu. Enjoy your sick days off, boys. So a bit of background first. I joined a bank and after a few months, we had a management change in the division. The new division head brought some of the guys from his previous bank. Usually that's how it works in banks in my country. But the prickle was that he treated the old team members like crap, and his boys were spending time surfing the net and presenting others' work to the management as their own. So since I was in their crap list, I was given slack on trivial issues. Despite having a workload that made me spend three to three and a half hours overtime daily, and no, I was not getting overtime. I went down with the flu one day and called in sick. The manager called me and asked me to come in anyways as there was a big presentation due to be presented to the management by the head. I went to work, prepared the data and reports, went to the manager's cabin to show him the report. I made sure I sneezed into his face without even making an effort to put my hand or anything else near my face. After a couple of huge loud sneezes, I could see the semi-liquid boogers spread on the face of the boss and the report papers. I did similar things on the workstations of his trophy boys as well, when I was talking to them about the weather. Midday, I was told by my head to email him the reports and presentation slides and take the rest of the day off. Also, not to come to the office unless I am fully recovered. After a few days off, the flu turned out to be typhoid. When I joined back after the sick leave, I was told most of the boys had worked with the flu in the office, since I was already down and they couldn't afford the days off. Overall, spent two crappy years at that bank, resigned and moved on to another bank in a way that was prime pro-revenge stuff. Might be posting about it here. Let's see the response for this first. So, personally, I get being pretty frustrated on being actually sick and having to come into work. That said, I don't think realistically there's ever any appropriate grounds to try and purposely spread any kind of sickness, illness, no matter how bad it actually seems. You never truly know what you could have and you never truly know how other people around you could handle that thing. And you could probably just completely mess somebody up. 
I don't know, you can leave it in the comments if you disagree, but I think this is an exceptionally crappy thing to do to anybody, even if you want to get back at them. And our final story of the day is by Overripe Mandrake, Manager tries to micromanage me. I microemployee them. A few years back, I worked in finance for a big brand. My department was the weird one. We would do all sorts of different things from customer complaints to cash collection and accounting. My manager, N plus two, was an expert in her field and was very demanding. I was in charge of the biggest portfolio in the team and was quite busy every day. To top it off, every day you were assigned an inbox and were supposed to keep it up to date. 24 hour reply time max. This is where the micromanagement starts. Manager would regularly go through the inboxes and ask people through IM to deal with this or that email first as it was urgent. Still don't know how she would decide which emails were more important because it was pretty much always the same queries, but hey. And you had to drop anything and deal with her request immediately. One day though, I get five different requests from her in the span of five minutes. No problem for me, I take the first one and work my way through them chronologically. Suddenly, an IM comes through. Did you take care of request number four? I reply that I'm not there yet because I'm still on number three. It was like 10 minutes after she sent those requests, and while easy, they still needed investigation. She tells me that I need to do number 4 ASAP, and she shouldn't even have to tell me. Basically, I had to read her mind to know which one she wanted handled first. Being no psychic, I decided to do the next best thing. Ask her what she needed me to do first. I would check my inbox for the day, select the most sensitive emails, and ask her which one she needed me to handle first. Did that for a week and got told to deal with the inboxes I would normally do. Could you imagine coming in every single day and getting micromanaged on what you need to do and then you go to actually start on that thing you were being micromanaged about and get micromanaged again saying, no, you need to do this other thing that I already told you to do. It already confuses me just trying to lay it out and I would very quickly get tired of that system. It kind of feels like you're having to go into work and then you're having to deal with like a power tripping parent or something that demands all your attention and demands you to do exactly this right now because I told you to. And then in response, OP did what kids do and tried to annoy their parents as much as possible and it effectively worked, it effectively broke the micromanaging because they realized, you know what, unless it's something that I spur of the moment micromanage, this is too much work. Good job OP. The Tribulations of Commuting by Bike, A Tale of Not Paying Attention Before I begin, I need to make a couple of important points. 1. I'm on mobile so excuse grammar and formatting. 2. This happened 5 years or so ago. 3. This happened in the UK. On with our tale. The company I had been working at brought in new rules, processes and whatnot regarding business continuity and as such, we all had to switch to laptops that had to be taken home with us. I was one of four people who commuted almost exclusively via motorbike, except in the depths of the winter, and herein lied the problem for us bikers. The rules they set up didn't include any provision for bikers, even the lycra louts. I was the first to speak to HR and the department organizing all this to ask about this. As all the rules said, the laptop had to be kept in the stowage area of the vehicle, i.e. the boot or trunk for you yanks. However, bikes don't have this. Also, part of the terms and conditions of my insurance stated I cannot carry items over a certain size and or weight in a backpack while riding. Also, lithium batteries could not be carried this way, full stop. I actually checked and four of the last five insurance policies I have state this. 
HR responded with we have to abide by the rules, and as such we must have relevant storage fitted to our bikes. However, the storage items themselves are company property and can't be used for personal things. Also, the company will pay for this to be done. Also, if you need to add insurances for carrying work items, you must obtain this and the company will reimburse you. If you don't do this and refuse to take your laptop home, you will face disciplinary until you do. Here is where we bikers get clever. We all go to the same place in my city that works on bikes and all purchase the same kit for our bike, which is a frame for attaching the pannier boxes and top boxes and purchase a full set of boxes for each bike. Then we also buy separately another full set of boxes. During this, it turns out three out of four bikes will need some rear panels cutting into to allow the frames to attach. Because of this, we had the shop order new panels for the bikes as well. We all then approached HR and handed over the bills, approximately 400 to 600 British pounds per bike for the frame and fitting, and another 500 pounds for the boxes. We got cheaper boxes in the second order. My bill total was 1080 including value added tax. HR actually refused to pay anything as they said it was our choice to fit the stuff or face disciplinary for not taking the laptops home each day. At which point, the most senior of us pulled out the email that said they would pay for the work. He argued the company was essentially blackmailing us and he wouldn't stand for it. However, HR stood firm. It took nearly six weeks of arguing, especially after we billed them for the replacement body panels that were only small but we wanted as new parts if the frames were removed, but in the end, after a threat of involving solicitors, lawyers to you yanks, the company backed down. However, they refused any future requests and exempted staff with only bikes of a main transport, not including public, from being disciplined for not taking laptops home. So in the end, I got a pannier and top box frame attached to my bike and paid for by the company. And I bought a sweet set of panniers and boxes as well for when I left. The company paid out around £5,000 in total to us four bikers. However, they never learnt, and I still hear of them making dumb mistakes or oversights that end up costing them money, in one case, over a million. Take care and stay safe all. You would definitely think in a process like this, they would start with, okay, we want everybody taking a laptop home. Let's begin with assessing how everybody gets home, and if that's realistic for everybody to take a laptop home. Instead, their thought process probably jumped to, laptops aren't that big, everybody can take it home. Do you think it would be realistic to expect everybody at a workplace to just take a laptop home every single day, no problem? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Neber VLC. Wherever the statue goes, I must go? Sure thing. I have worked slash collaborated some years with the police in my city, Valencia, Spain. And to this day, they still tell the tale of the funniest malicious compliance that was done by two officers in the late 80s slash early 90s. There was a festivity where a statue was walked in a procession through the city center and ending in the port of Valencia, putting it in a ship in order to transport it to its original place. Two police officers were entrusted with escorting the statue with their motorbikes. The inspector who ordered it was said to be rude and said something in the lines of, You better be glued to the statue. Wherever it goes, you two go with it. The service seemingly went okay for the police officers, but after some days, the police department received a call from the Port Authority informing that there were two police motorbikes parked several days inside the port. That was when the inspector realized what had happened. Cue the malicious compliance. As you may have already guessed, the police officers went inside the boat together with the statue. The statue belonged to a cathedral located in Ibiza, 110 kilometers from Valencia, and they spent some days in the aisle enjoying themselves before going back to Valencia. When the superiors finally contacted them and ordered them to come back. They did what they were told, and decades later their colleagues that are still working, 
in Spain, local police can work until 65 years, still remember this tale as one of the funniest moments they have ever lived inside the police department. I mean, hey, if you're telling me to take a trip for free, I'ma go sightseeing. Thanks, boss. See you in a couple days. This next story is by Ansela Johnla. If you absolutely insist that I have to move this pallet immediately, then move it I will. I'm a retail merchandiser. I assist with refits or new store setups, or sometimes just get sent to be an extra pair of hands where a store has too many people off sick or on holiday. And even during refits, we're sometimes expected to work the delivery for the aisles that we have been rearranging that night, as the store's own staff have, for obvious reasons, been unable to access them all night. On this particular shift, we've been doing the beers, wines, and spirits section. Now, this is the sort of shift where you're practically guaranteed to get some wastage. Bottle smash, can split, it's just accepted as the price of moving literally hundreds of them in the course of a single night. All you can do is hope you're not the one who goes home smelling like a brewery. We'd finished up the actual move and had started working the six pallets of delivery as well, but the store manager was fretting. He was starting to get very antsy about our chances of finishing up and clearing the floor before the store opened for the day and his main concern was about how we were handling the overstocks. We had absolutely blitzed the first pallet, all hands working it and it alone, in order to empty it so we could stack the overstocks onto it. As soon as the last case of booze was removed from the blue boards, we moved the overstocks onto it and then split up to work the other five pallets simultaneously. As we worked, we added more to the first pallet. When we're in luck, we can get the overstocks from six pallets of delivery onto a single pallet. By the time the manager came around, dragging a pump truck with him, the stack was about four boxes high, about hip height on me. It wasn't the prettiest pallet stack you've ever seen, but it was stable, while it wasn't moving. Someone had gone to fetch a roll of pallet wrap so we could move it safely, but that's the sort of thing that store staff tend to hide and guard jealously so we knew he'd be gone a while. The manager says, What's this pallet? Someone says, Delivery overs. Someone says, Delivery overs. It needs to be off the floor. Someone else says, Coworker has gone to get the shrink. I want it gone now. Team leader says, It's not safe to move without wrap. You don't need that if it's stacked properly. Move it now. At that point, he shoved the handle of the pump truck at the closest person, which was me. And he stood back to make sure that we removed the pallet from the shop floor. Now, I'm not the best pump truck operator in the world. I have a lack of proprioception that extends to anything that I'm pushing, pulling, carrying, or steering. Normally, I wouldn't go anywhere near a pallet of glass bottles, but everyone else backed away. They knew what would happen if anyone jacked that pallet up and tried to move it, and they wanted no part of it. The manager obviously wanted it moving though, and it was his store. So I carefully got the forks under the pallet no ramming it in for this baby, gently lifted it off the floor and started moving as smoothly as I could. One step, two steps, three steps, enter the slalom of bakery tables and fridges between alcohol and warehouse. I surprised myself by getting past the individual rolls table without incident, but when I started to maneuver around the cream cakes fridge, I heard the unmistakable sound of bottle smashing. I looked behind me to confirm it. A corner of the pallet had decided to acquaint itself with the linoleum-covered concrete floor. Wine, whiskey, vodka, and rum were all mixed in a spreading puddle on the floor. Oh, and on the manager who'd been following behind, presumably wanting his pump truck back once the pallet was stowed away, who hadn't bothered to try and stabilize the collapsing boxes. My team leader had also been following at a more sensible distance. Team leader says, looks like it needed wrapping. Safety first, man, especially when you're dealing with a bunch of glass and cans and whatnot. I'm willing to bet that was a pretty expensive mistake that the manager forced upon themselves. 
It was his store. And our final story of the day is by Dementation Revised. My timesheets aren't accurate enough? Alright then. Timesheets have become a battle at work in our relatively small but growing company. To wit, our timesheets serve two masters. On the one hand, they provide important information on where all of our efforts are going and who is being overworked. On the other, they form the basis of our billing to our clients. I'm a technical PM who occasionally jumps in to do admin work on a Salesforce database when our solution architects and BAs are too busy. I'm rusty and I don't feel clients should have to pay for me having to re-remember how to do something or search something, do a write-up, and run it by an SA before implementing in our sandboxes. I suggest something similar to our admin trainees. Because they're learning, I tell them to bill half the time they worked on deliverables to our client and half to a training budget while they get their bearings so the client isn't being billed for learning time. New management feels that as a result, our timesheets are inaccurate. Consequently, they now review my timesheets on a weekly basis, despite the fact that I only do it to save clients money. Fair enough, I suppose. Except that a few clients have essentially signed separate work orders for major overhauls to the system with a budget associated with each. Easy if you're doing the actual work, as our BAs and SAs do. Problem is, our time tracking system has zero tasks associated with overhead, and a lot of what I do is scrape the system to create documentation, internal and external, keep track of overall schedule, and keep as much unnecessary paperwork away from our SA and BA as possible. In other words, overhead. I have asked for tasks associated with overhead to be included and or better guidance on what to do if I don't feel the client should be billed for work for one reason or another. A number of people have shared my concern. We have gotten nothing of the sort and I continue to have timesheet reviews. The most guidance I got was, write detailed notes and we can figure it out afterwards. Well, okay then. Timesheets now get updated every hour. Clients with ton of tasks and subtasks and no overhead get a completely unique, ad hoc solutions to how the time is notated. The notes section of each item provides a detailed explanation of why I entered the amount of time that I did for the particular task, including whether or not it was an arbitrary division. The notes are quite detailed. If it ever takes me at least 10 minutes to type up my explanations, I throw in a 15 minute log time for explaining how my time was supposed to work and why I build my work where I did, which gets charged to HR tasks. I also give them a 15 minute charge every day for making and remaking coffee and a generic 15 minute charge for bathroom breaks, both clearly labeled as such. Having recently been told that level of detail was gratuitous and unnecessary, I simply informed them that the guidance I was given was to write detailed notes, and until I have a way of denoting overhead in a consistent fashion that does not arbitrarily hit fixed funds for deliverables the clients expect, I will do what I was told was best practice. Our reviews have gotten quite boring as I assure my supervisors that everything I have to say is on the timesheet, and I have nothing further to add. The point is, there is no overhead task associated with client work, and that's a lot of what I do. I was audited for inconsistencies regarding the training code, explained the issue, but pointed out that without an overhead task associated with clients, I'm either arbitrarily charging random tasks for specific agreements, or I'm burying that potential revenue in internal overhead anyways. That issue has not been fixed and I continue to be audited. Hence the malicious compliance. I'm not going to keep finding loosely associated tasks to stuff my time into and then sit there at a meeting justifying why I arbitrarily cut up my time the way I did. It's in my absurdly detailed notes, which I wouldn't need if I just had an overhead task for a client. You want to take those hours and bill them? Be my guest. Don't eat the cost to remain competitive. I have no dog in that fight, but either give me the tools to accurately represent my time, or don't complain about my fiction. You know, 
Sometimes it seems like the most simplest thing is something so hard for a corporation to do. I'm just going to assume that there's some kind of stickler along the line that's just completely not allowing anything to be kind of conformed to make things easier on anyone else because that's the way it is. Long calls equals better bonus? Hold my beer. A brief story from my time in a telecoms contact center. I worked for a rather large Australian provider that everyone knows and actively hates, mostly because it's fun to hate them. In this story, we were doing outbound calls to transition people onto the new NBN network. For those of you unfamiliar with Australia's internet, it was third world, literally. We were slower than Nigeria until we rolled out the NBN and upgraded to slightly faster third world speeds. Also worth mentioning, much like the company I worked for, the NBN was universally hated. Cause it was crap. Nuff said. Anyway, like all call centers, we had a bunch of miserable hoops to jump through in order to bring our paycheck up to a level that could be considered humane. Our capitalist overlords refer to these hoops as KPIs, Key Performance Indicators for the Blissfully Ignorant. Anyway, with the new campaign came a new set of KPIs, Conversion Rate, Active Call Time, After Call Time, and Customer Satisfaction were the KPIs of the day. Now, these KPIs were normally all freaking BS. You needed to meet some freaking god-tier numbers in order to collect a half-decent paycheck. However, in this particular case, there was a loophole. See, due to the controversial nature of the NBN, we were told to focus on quality over quantity. They wanted an excellent customer experience, and the new KPIs were a reflection of that. As such, quantity of conversions was not a KPI, and when I questioned if we had time limits on calls, I was told, we don't care what you do, but long calls means a good experience, so keep them on the line and get them switched over. And so began the best work month I had at that soul trap. See, before entering comms, I was a salesman in aged care, and a pretty good one at that. And you know that stereotype of old people talking for eternity and beyond? It's a stereotype for a reason. Each morning I would log in, volunteer for the aged clientele campaign, which was easy because they were normally the hardest people to convert, fearful of scams, technology and such, so not many people wanted to do it. And then I would start to chat. See, when speaking with the elderly, all it takes is a well-placed poke or two, and you can literally have them speak for hours. So, for the next month, I took two to four calls a day, down from 20 to 30, had almost zero after call time, the calls were so long I didn't need it, had an 80% conversion rate, and 90% customer satisfaction. Turns out people tend to like you after you take the time to listen to them. Each phone call, assuming I wasn't told to freak off upon introducing myself, would last two to three hours minimum, with my record being a seven hour call to a lovely bloke named Stan. He told some great war stories. I ended up doubling my normal paycheck, and my managers, while not being entirely happy with my nonsense, put up with it because at the end of the day, those were the rules and KPIs we were given. I got my paycheck, the oldies got a good chat, and my employer got to pay through the nose. Happy endings for all. I proceeded to hand in my resignation once KPIs went back to normal, which I, to this day, regard as one of the best decisions I ever made. So considering what you may know previously and what you heard in this story, do you personally think that performance-based incentives are a scam in the workplace? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Our next story is by Alula. We'll follow the quote and contract as requested. I explained what a malicious compliance was to my dad. English is not our first language, so he wasn't familiar with the term. And he told me a story of his own. For a little bit of backstory, my dad works for Mike, the owner of a construction company. Part of my dad's job is to study the plans and quote and place a bid on the company's behalf. Important to note that the quote is usually made by someone with knowledge about construction and the different steps required for the job. One day, my dad receives a quote which looks a bit botched. 
The document is a patchwork of different sections taken from past quotes of similar jobs. The whole thing has been made by Janine McJanine Incorporated. Far from knowing anything related to construction, Janine is actually the executive director of the town's council. Not making any sense of the plans, Mike suggests to restrain from bidding on the job or to ask the mayor to issue new plans made by a professional. My dad tells them that instead, they should take the job as it is and work the details later. Mike's company places a bid on the job and, unsurprisingly, gets it. It only takes a few days to hit a rock wall. See, the top 30% of the ground they had to dig was easily removed. As for the remaining 70%, it was solid rock and needed special equipment to deal with it. The contract usually has multiple instructions in regards of unexpected situation. The workers can just refer to the contract and follow the authorized solutions. However, no such informations were in the botched contract. Q malicious compliance. Not wanting to rent the specialized equipment at their own expense, Mike's company contacted the mayor's office. Mayor has to discuss the issue with the council, only to come to the inevitable conclusion that they have to pay for the equipment. All the while, the workers on the construction site still get paid while waiting for the decision. What had estimated as a 30k job ended up costing the town 90k. And to my dad's knowledge, Janine never did a quote for the town ever again. Yeah, I feel like if you're going to file and submit a job for some kind of construction company that's going to cost multiple tens of thousands of dollars, you might want to make sure that the entire contract of the job is written by a proper professional. Good work, Janine. This next story is by T-Bone XXIV. Shut up and turn on the gas? Okay. This is a really old event. And for the record, I am a decent enough human being to feel really bad about how this came out. After I was done feeling vindicated and amused. I felt extra bad because of those feelings, so I guess it somewhat balances. Back in the late 80s through the mid 90s, my dad grew watermelons every year. It's a good cash crop, but intensive on the physical labor side of things, and you're working hardest when the weather is hottest. You have to work really hard to pick the melons when they are ready to pick, as healthy vines will bump out growth on the remaining melons fast in late June, so you can pick again in just a few days. So only a certain type of person is willing and able to really capitalize on the crop. My dad was just that certain type of person. He was transitioning all of his farming activity from row crops like corn and peanuts and cotton to pecans. He needed that summer cash crop of watermelons to stay afloat until the pecans were paying off. I worked for him at the time, and part of the successful transition from row crops to pecans hinged upon using buried drip irrigation for the pecans. For six years, I buried drip irrigation for several months every year. We were able to water groves with $2,000 wells instead of the $200,000 wells needed with sprinklers big difference. Anyway, we irrigated the melons with drip irrigation too. Only it wasn't durable stuff used on melons. It was thin, cheap stuff made to last a season and no more. The plastic film covering the beds was one mil thick and would photodegrade from sunlight in a year. The drip tape itself did need to be picked up and disposed. So this one year, my dad gets a bright idea to burn the film at the end of the season instead of letting it break down slowly. A local agriculture company has a towable burn rig we can rent. Now this thing is just the sort of rig no one in their right mind would ensure. I'll describe it because it was a real monster. Okay, start with a thousand gallon propane tank. The huge kind you see in some yards that only have to be filled every couple of years. Now you put that mamba jamba on top of a homemade trailer made to be pulled behind a farm tractor. And you hook up a pump to the PTO on the tractor so that it can pump the propane, not just let it flow from expansive properties. Cause you need a lot of propane to flow for this kind of beast. Then the back of the homemade trailer has a support shaft mounted across it and there are two long boom shafts on the hinges that fold forward for transport but can be locked perpendicular like wings when deployed. 
They are 16 feet long each. The trailer is 8 feet across. So when the wings are deployed, this bad boy spans 40 feet. Every 4 feet, on all 3 shafts, there is a torch. These torches are angled down and backwards. The idea is that a flaming jet of propane would hit every scrap of plastic film and burn it away. We won't even get into the environmental aspects. So this was August, all the melons were done and cleanup needed to happen. My dad rented this beast, had me hook it up to a tractor and meet him in one of the fields. There were two controls up in the cab with the operator, both toggle switches. One of them was to turn on the gas for the pilot lights on the torches. The other was to go full on burn everything in sight. But it was a windy day, maybe 10 to 15 miles per hour average. I was not comfortable. I voiced my objections to burning on a windy day and got shut down hard. Told to just do as I was told. Okay then. So I'm sitting up there in the cab following instructions. I get told to turn on the gas for the pilot light, so I do. And then I sit there for a good 5-10 to 10 minutes twiddling my thumbs because it's too darned windy to be burning stuff. It's too windy to get the torches to light. The breeze is so stiff it is dissipating the gas and blowing out the old man's lighter repeatedly. And I'm just sitting there doing as instructed. After another 50 or 60 failed attempts, my dad slash old man slash boss was reaching the end of his patience and yelled up at me to not just sit there. Turn on the full gas. Now, I was annoyed and didn't want to be out there, but this just seemed to be a bad idea. So I spoke up. But that will, he says, shut up, do what I said. But shut up, either flip that switch or get down here and light it while I flip it. We need more gas to get it to light. I flip the switch. Torch ignites, shoots a jet of flame directly onto the old man's sandaled feet. Yes, that's right, he was wearing sandals. And he lit a wide open jet of propane that was aimed directly at those sandaled feet. I let out a loud bray of laughter just as I flipped the switch to off. The old man's head swiveled away from his feet to me in a trice, but despite my guffaw, I had a sober, morose expression plastered on. He couldn't wear shoes for a couple of weeks. While he didn't need dressings on his feet, they were pretty well done. We didn't burn any watermelon film that year. Just the idea of burning anything regardless sketches me out, let alone this monster machine full of torches and a massive amount of propane. I'd be good. I'd let the old man deal with that, hire somebody else. I don't know, I wouldn't be involved. Especially on a windy day. Our next story is by R 2086 Wanna pay half the price? Sure, but expect half the service. This is a story my grandma told me, so it may not be the most accurate. Also, I'm Dutch, so an apology if I spell stuff wrong. My grandma was, at the time of this story, about 10 years old. A lot of people didn't have cars back then, so she was surprised when she saw that her neighbor had bought one. One day, she was playing with her friend and saw the neighbor step out of his car and walk towards his house. The car looked like it was heavily used and had a lot of mud and filth on it. Then, my grandma and her friend went over to the neighbor's house and asked if they could wash his car for a little money. The neighbor said yes, but he told them he would only let them wash his car for half the price. Then, he closed the door. Here comes the malicious compliance. My grandma had an idea. She thought, if he's gonna pay half, we're gonna clean half. And so they did. They cleaned the front half of the car spotless. And from the back seat on, it stayed exactly the same. They went to the neighbor's house and knocked on his door. He opened the door, looked at his car, looked at the children, looked at his car again and had a look on his face that my grandma can only describe as unamused. At last, he gave them the other half of the money and got the rest of his car cleaned. I mean, fair's fair. They got quoted a price and they said, well, I'll only pay half that. So they went ahead and did half work. Just because you didn't like half your car looking terrible doesn't mean you had to pay them the other half. And our final story of the day is by Latami's fan. 
So you don't want me to throw out spoiled milk? Okay. I was in the US Navy on a destroyer back when it was wooden ships and iron men. I got assigned to the mess decks to do setup and cleanup. Well, the cook was terrible in every way, including ordering supplies. On one of the cruises, he ordered twice too much reconstituted milk, which came in five gallon cartons. Now, the milk wasn't very good to start with, so the crew wasn't drinking much, and the milk started to spoil. We would put it in the dispenser, sample it, and if it was spoiled, throw it out. The problem was, there was a lot of milk. And it got to the point, if you just got a whiff of spoiled milk, it would turn your stomach. We went to the cook, told him all the milk needed to be thrown out, but he refused. Here's where the malicious compliance comes in. None of us wanted to smell any more spoiled milk. So what we did was put the milk carton in the dispenser and placed a trash can nearby. Then we would stand back to spy. If anyone took a glass and immediately threw it in the trash, we would throw that carton out and load up another one. It took a month to get rid of all the bad milk. I get the unwillingness to want to throw out that much stock, especially when they made that order and it's so much supply. But if it's so obviously spoiled and not any good at all, just get rid of it. Just admit your mistake and save every man on this destroyer from having to constantly smell and witness and throw out this spoiled milk. Definitely not a great cook. Only take breaks when I tell you to. Sure, no problem. I used to work at a call center where we would get flooded with calls constantly. This is a story of how a busybody boss thought they understood everything since they were in charge. At work, we were given two 15-minute breaks and one 45-minute lunch break. The breaks were scheduled into our day so you could see when they would be, but this would change day by day. My role was a bit different than the normal agents as I was specifically dealing with the higher issue calls. These calls could take up to one hour to complete and the caller would need to stay on the line unless they were fine with a call back later, but this was rarely the case. Since I never knew when I would be getting these calls, my break times were a shot in the dark if I would or wouldn't be on a call. I would just take them as soon as the call was done, if they ever intersected, which they did 99% of the time. Enter my boss. During a performance review, I hit all the marks except for attendance. I asked about this as I know I missed a few days, but always with a reasonable update for time frame and never had a no-show day where there is no warning that I'm not coming in. My boss stated that attendance also applies to break and lunch times and since I rarely took them at the requested time, I was getting written up. I explained my role, that they hired me for, and the challenges involved. They did not care and stated I needed to take breaks when I was told to. I asked for them to send me an email so that I could print it out, put it on my desk, and never forget again. My boss smiled ear to ear, probably because they thought I was groveling at that point, and sure enough, they did, stating in the email, you must take your breaks only when the schedule tells you to, no time else. There is no excuse. I saved it, printed it out, sent a copy to my own email, and followed it to the letter. Next call that happened that same day, of course, had the long call crossing over with a break issue. I asked the customer if it would be okay for a call back. They said no. I stated that unfortunately I cannot stay on the line as I am required to take my break. They became enraged and demanded to speak with my boss. I told my boss. They said that I need to apologize and finish the call. I showed them the email they just sent to me and said, you told me to take my break at this time, no matter what. I'm just doing what you told me to do. I'm taking my break. Would you like the customer transferred over or should I just hang up? They took the call over and from that day on, I never had a missed attendance mark. God, busybody bosses are the worst. Let me ask you guys, in situations like this where it comes between your boss being upset at you and the customers being upset with their experience, which side would you tend to lean towards? 
Do you think it's better to comply with the boss's demands to the letter and take the break even if it's in the middle of a call, or do you think it's better to finish out that call, make sure their experience is okay, and try and explain it to the boss afterwards? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Original Deadly Sin, If Only You Hadn't Argued. Working escalations, complaints to a supervisor for internet tech support, I have an agent send me an angry customer over because he needs a tech to his house but doesn't want to wait for our first available window. That's not unusual. What is unusual is that the window is 12 to 2 Monday and it's currently 10.30 on Monday. Yes, that's an hour and a half from now. That's insane for us. We're usually about two days on average to have someone come out. So the agent sends him over to me. Here's the high points. I say, this is only 90 minutes away. That's extremely fast. Looking at the tech schedule, this is my only appointment available today. Then there's one on Wednesday, 4 to 6, then pretty much any time from Thursday on. Even having this one available so close is highly unusual. Someone probably canceled their appointment a few minutes ago for this one to be here. I definitely can't do better. Are you sure you don't want this one? No, do not book me that time, you hear me? An hour and a half is too long. I want someone now! This is ridiculous, you people are awful! This goes on for a good 20 minutes before they give in. Fine, I'll take it, I guess. Well, I have bad news. While we've been arguing, someone else snapped up that appointment. It's not there to give it to you anymore. The first available now is that one from 4 to 6 Wednesday. What? I want 12 to 2 today! I'm sorry, you wouldn't take it, so we didn't book it, and now someone else has. Now this goes on for another 20 minutes while they argue both about losing their option for today and how Wednesday is too long of a wait. Fine, I'll take 4-6 to six Wednesday, but I am not happy. Who wants to guess what happened next? Yep, you're right. Well, I have some bad news. During that conversation, someone booked that time as well. We don't have any times until Thursday. Gah! Customer hangs up. Disclaimer, in the interest of customer service, yes, I could have booked the earlier appointments while letting them argue, but with how adamantly and loudly they snapped at me when I offered to do so right off the start, I was happy to comply and low-key hoped for this exact thing to happen. I don't know if they called back later or what. I never heard about this customer again. What did this guy think it was, a pizza delivery? 90 minutes is unheard of for a tech to come out to your house. That's like magical levels of service. That guy just had no idea of what's what. This next story is by Isgordio. Phones must be left in the office. I work in a dental practice, and over the Christmas period, we had too many staff and not enough patients. This resulted in a lot of people using their phones during their shift, as all of the things they could have done had been finished. My manager wasn't happy with this, so they sent out an email demanding all employees leave their phones in the office during the day, and we can't have them on us. I left my phone in my bag, in my locker, in a locked room. I got pulled up for not putting my phone in the office. It's one rule for everyone. Except the receptionist that watches TV shows on her phone all day, she's exempt for some reason. And if I didn't put my phone into the office, I would get a written warning on my record. Day one, I put my phone into the office, even though it was safe in my locker, but I must follow the rules. Day two, I left my phone in my locker and put an old phone in the office. I must follow the rules. The rules didn't specify it has to be the phone I use daily, just that it is a phone I own. Edit, day three, I've been caught out and now I have two phones in the office. Well, now that OP has two phones in the office, time to get a new new phone and see if they call you out on it again. See how many layers there are to this, how deep the rabbit hole can go. Our next story is by J. Bain Law. Manager says, company policy is we do not pay for overtime. Tech says, sure, okay, whatever. Sometimes, as a consultant, you get to see how an office functions from an outsider perspective. 
Since you are an independent contractor, the company treats you differently than an employee. Also, just due to the nature of the contract work, your engagement is usually short term. This makes you a temporary fixture and sometimes are just treated as the fly on the wall like you do not exist. And this can lead to some interesting observations, including seeing train wrecks in progress. This is one of those tales. Not so much about the nuts and bolts of tech support, but more about the people and some good old fashioned just desserts. Background As a consultant, you are always going to be the IT guy, whether you like it or not. No matter how you market your services, every single company is going to assume you can do anything with a computer. And when business is slow, this is not necessarily a bad thing if you just need work. About 10 years ago, I found myself in a situation. I got an inquiry through my website asking about assistance deploying some workstations and other mundane tasks. Usually, I would pass on this kind of work, but it was winter and the other client work was dry that month. A guy still has to pay the bills, so I followed up and within a day, the scope of work was signed. Easy stuff. The company had its own IT department, but just needed some extra hands. I was going to be one of three outside contractors that would deploy some workstations, do some server admin work, and set up some other equipment for a new department. The money wasn't the best, but it was time I had free, and it was all swing shift work, meaning no traffic and I get to sleep in. Not bad. The first day. I report as requested about 3pm and talk to our contact. He was a senior engineer in charge of part of the IT department there. Seeing he really doesn't have time to do anything more than a quick introduction as they are slammed with work, he shows us the ropes and leaves us to it. Between three of us, we break down our specialties and parse out the work. Everyone knows this is a cakewalk of a job and wants to just get it done fast, as the pay was flat rate. I take the server work and see my contact who's the system administrator. Figuring he was probably gone for the day as it was mid-evening, I was just going to leave him a note asking him to call me. But to my surprise, he is at his desk. In fact, just about everyone in the IT department are milling around. Didn't think much of it at the time, just that it was one busy department and the guys must be pulling double shifts. He shows me the systems and I get to work. Around midnight, we are wrapping up for the night and the three of us break down what we have left with the senior engineer who is still on site. The plan is to wait until Friday night to deploy the workstations and get everything in place. The senior engineer says most of his team will probably be there all weekend anyhow, so it doesn't matter to him. I left thinking, man, that is a busy place. Those guys must be really pulling down the overtime. I wonder what is going on, they have so much work. As I walked out the door that night. Soon enough, I would find out the deal. Friday night. Head to the work site a little early on Friday, figuring if we all pull a long night, we should be able to wrap it up and all get our weekends back. Things are going great, and we are ahead of schedule, so the senior engineer offers to take us out to a local diner while we wait for the office to close up, so we can deploy workstations without tripping over people. At the diner, senior engineer says, I want to thank you guys for all your hard work. We are all overworked and when we got approval to contract out this job, everyone was excited. I say, hey, glad to be of service. Looks like you guys are crazy busy. Is everyone pulling doubles and doing weekends to handle your ticket load? Senior engineer says, oh, we are understaffed so we all have to pull extra hours. I say, that sucks, but must be some great overtime. Overtime, not really, we are all salaried, some loophole or something. We just put in the time because we all need the job right now. The conversation trailed off from there, but it left me thinking. In this state, most IT workers are eligible for overtime as a matter of law. There is no loophole like that. Something isn't right. Back at the work site. I'm in the network closet with the systems administrator, hooking up some ports and finishing the server work. He is a friendly guy, so we start chatting. I was talking to your buddy and it seems like you guys work insane hours here. I ask, trying to fish for a little information. 
Systems admin says, Oh yeah, it's been like this for a year. 60 hours is a light week these days. It is BS. Yeah, the other guy said you don't get overtime. The systems admin laughs. That is what the boss tells us. Let me show you something. He pulls up an email exchange he had with his manager. It is dated about 10 months ago and makes the very point I thought that the entire department should be getting overtime and the law requires it. His boss's response in bold and caps was, It is company policy to not pay any overtime. Working more than 40 hours is part of the job. Deal with it or find another place to work. Then the system admin smirks and shows me his response to the boss. Sure, okay, whatever, his emphasis. And that was the end of the exchange. I say, look, I'm not a lawyer, but you might want to call up the labor department. I'm pretty sure it is illegal for you to not be getting overtime. Then to my surprise, the system admin pulls up another email from his personal account. Oh, it is blatantly illegal. I asked the lawyer and this was his response. He showed me a memo explaining the law and that most likely a lawsuit would be successful. This was dated about 9 months ago. Me confused. So you guys know you should be getting overtime but not getting paid and everyone is okay with that? We all make sure to log all of our hours and document the time. Me still confused. But you still aren't getting actually paid overtime? No, but we will. Here's the kicker. According to the lawyer, the labor department will look back at the hours we put in for the last 12 months and award us retroactive overtime. So all of us just log our time and keep records, then in about a month we are going to file the claim all together. The company is going to be on the hook for all that overtime and they won't be allowed to fire any of us for reporting them either. Then the coup de grace. We all figured when this whole thing started, if we pressed the point back then, they would just figure out a way to screw us. So we just all decided to stay quiet, put in the time they tell us to work, and we will get our bonus check when it is all said and done if this stuff is all backdated. Dang, that is some cold stone strategizing. How many hours do you think you guys have piled up? Hard to tell. Everyone keeps their own paper logs to keep it quiet. We also don't talk about it too much, so nothing gets out, but last time we met outside of work, it was a boatload of time. I figure for myself, they will owe me about 13 to 14 months of salary and overtime, and when it is all said and done, out of damages, penalties, interest, it will probably total almost two years of pay. Holy... So if the guys won't talk about it and seem eager to work all these long hours, now you know why. We finished up the job that night. I exchanged contact information with a few guys and said if they had any other contract work to think about giving me a call. That was it. Until... Three months later. I am at another job and see an email come in from the systems administrator. Subject line, overtime claim. Hey IT guy, hope you're doing well. We all ended up filing a big overtime claim with the state and the company fired us for supposedly falsifying our timesheets. The lawyer is sorting it all out, but anyway I wanted to know if I could give your name to an investigator who is looking for witnesses to verify some of the extra hours we worked. Some details followed. I agreed to talk to the investigator and got a call about a week later. He asked me some routine questions about times and dates and wanted me to email him over some proof I did the job. Then he started going into the details of the case. We got this company for probably a million in overtime and damages between all the guys in the department, plus the firing is probably illegal so that is going to be another few hundred thousand on top of it. The insurance company wants to settle and once we wrap up the due diligence work, I think these guys are all going to make out rather nicely. I didn't hear anything for a while until another email came in from the system's administrator, subject line, re overtime claim. Just wanted to let you know that we settled this whole thing. Company caved pretty quick once it was clear we kept honest logs of our time and the local management violated parent company regulations for the sake of making their site budget look better. Can't go into details, but we all got sizable checks, enough to pay off some loans and go back to school. 
I'll have to find a new job, but after I get my grad degree, that shouldn't be an issue. Appreciate you talking to the investigators. Thanks, IT guy. Man, I don't know if I would have the patience to play the long con game like that. Imagine spending a whole year working countless overtime and not getting compensated fairly for it. All just for the idea that at the very end of that year you will get that money back. It takes some hardcore people to stick that out. And what about anybody that might have gotten fired along the way? Do they just kind of keep in touch and hop onto that when they can at the end of the year? It's great that it worked out, but there might have been a lot of stuff that could have gone wrong with that. And our final story of the day is by Green Veins. Respect your privacy and don't contact you for anything? No problem. My mother-in-law offered to give us $10,000 for Christmas for a house down payment. Low cost of living state plus we were going to do an FHA loan. We were elated and grateful. Christmas comes around and she tells us we can't have a check because it has to sit in her bank for 7 days. Okay, that's fine but sort of a bummer. So the day after Christmas comes and she doesn't even ask. She just calls and starts with, You can swing by any time and pick up my card for SIGs and Mountain Dew. Sure, I don't mind helping. But the entire following week, she has us run errands for her. Things she can do herself but refuses to. Husband tells her he's not getting out after it just leaded for 8 hours straight and she decides to hold that check over our heads. If you can't help me, then I'm not giving you a darn thing. Husband tells her to take the money and shove it up her butt. What was the task? She wanted to sit at home while he drives an hour on icy roads to pick up a mattress and then drag her old one out of the house and discard it in a dumpster that's not even hers. I get a text. I'm done with you both. Don't ask me for a darn thing and respect my privacy. And don't call me for nothing. Well, I'll be darned if that same day she ran out of propane. She wanted my brother-in-law to drive on icy roads to come get her. She's been holding his check over his head too, and he said he's not risking wrecking his only vehicle to come get her. She ended up paying for an express order of propane, but she called us that night. I can't believe no one checked up on me. Husband said, you told us to respect your privacy. If it's a gift, then gift it. I don't blame anybody for wanting to just flat out give up on that if it's going to be lorded over them like that. They just think that they're better than you and they can get anything they want because they're going to give you a big sum of money. Well, that's not a gift. That's just cruel. I'd respect her privacy too. Annoying my annoying form tutor at secondary school. UK 12 to 16 year olds. At my secondary school that I attended in the noughties, every pupil was given a planner. A small A5 diary that we would list our homework to-do list and any other school-related items that need attention. At the bottom of each week, there were two lines for signatures. One for our form tutor and one for our parents slash guardian. The idea being that our parents would keep an eye on our homework schedule and make sure we were keeping up to date. Now my sister had got quite good at forging our mother's signature and her form tutor didn't really check his student's planners because he was about 60, old school hard man who didn't appreciate petty little things like signatures. Think Ron Swanson but with a thick British working class accent. He once even removed the headmaster from his classroom because he didn't want to be disturbed while drinking his tea. Absolute legend. Anyway, this story sadly isn't about him, it's about my form tutor. I declined the offer from my sister to forge a signature because I wanted to play a trick on my tutor for being an a-hole and I wanted to do it honestly. You see, my tutor was all about authority and hierarchy. He was a young chap who had only recently qualified as a teacher and the power had already gone to his head. His classes were rarely fun and he always made you feel inferior. Cue my malicious compliance. As anyone who has attended school in the past 30 years can attest, stationery played an important part of your coolness, and so every student had a spectrum of color gel pens, highlighters, markers, and even glitter glue sticks. My form tutor, in trying to assert his dominance, announced that students write in blue or black ink and only I, being a teacher, write in red ink. 
The first weekly planner check comes around and I show him my mother's signature in red ink. Well, he thinks this must be stamped out immediately. Stands up from his desk to explain to the class about how this is a perfect example of how things can get muddled because of the wrong color ink. And he repeats the claim that only he can use red ink because he is a teacher. He turns to me and asks me why I think this is appropriate, and I reply, not only to him, but to the entire class. Sir, my mother is the headmistress of so and so school and she has also sat on the school's board of governors for the last five years. His face turned as red as the ink. I sat back down in my seat, and the entire class learned a valuable lesson in malicious compliance. I made sure every week that my mother signed in red ink just so he had to place his signature next to it and remember his weakened authority. So would you actually agree with this teacher's notion that only the teacher should be writing in red ink? I think mainly because they want to be able to mark stuff and make notes and point out things in their red ink that clearly only belongs to the teacher. Or do you think that's just too restrictive? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Nightfire3497. Supervisor gave me a verbal warning for being their best employee and then complained that I'm following the rules as a result? Fine. Let me talk to your supervisor. Back in 2018, I started working at a delivery company. When I started working, they gave me a rule book that stated that all drivers cannot exceed 5 miles per hour over the designated speed limit. All drivers were required to take their lunch breaks, 30 minutes unpaid, on the way back to our facility at the end of their first run. Most drivers had two runs in a day. And we were also required to load our vans ourselves in the morning and unload any undelivered items when we got back. Our delivery vans were equipped with trackers that monitored our speed and would beep loudly if you went over 74 miles per hour. Malicious Compliance I had been working at this company for over a year without any issue, and I had quickly become one of the more valuable drivers by taking on extra runs and staying late to help out other drivers. Most of the time, my delivery routes took me on highways that were listed at 65 miles per hour, but if I was covering another driver's route, there was a chance that the highways were listed at 55 miles per hour. I was the driver that finished their runs in record time by not taking my lunch break and driving just under the van trucker's max speed trigger, even if it meant going 20 miles per hour above the listed speed limit. I did this because our company prided itself on having fast response time on same-day deliveries, and my supervisors turned a blind eye to my speeding. That is, until they gave me a verbal warning about speeding. I'm not sure what happened to make them change. All I know is that as soon as I got the warning, I initiated malicious compliance mode. I started doing everything by the book. I drove at exactly the listed speed limit and started taking my lunch breaks. My efficiency tanked and the company was falling behind on deliveries because I wasn't there to take on any last minute orders, so they had to hire more drivers. I would just sit in a parking lot somewhere listening to Reddit stories on YouTube during the entirety of my lunch breaks. And to make things even better, if there were slower vehicles on the highway, I would make sure to stay behind them and drive at their speed, even if it meant driving at 10 to 20 miles per hour under the speed limit. Fallout My supervisors were extremely pissed at me for causing them so many issues, but they couldn't really do anything about it. And oh boy did they try. They tried changing my routes, giving me only one run for the day, and telling me that I was required to take my lunch break after I returned from my run. I ended up getting them off my back by going to my supervisor's supervisor and explaining everything to them, which in turn basically made me untouchable to my supervisors. I simply continued following the rules, and if I ended with overtime because of it, oh well. That's on the supervisor's head, not mine. To me, OP's original strategy of dealing with work came with its own time limit. I think it was only a matter of time before that kind of action got shut down, 
Going way above the speed limit, not taking a lunch break, it was just bound to get cancelled one way or another eventually. Thing is, and the resolution of the story is, the supervisors had no ground to stand on to complain when OP did start doing everything exactly by the book. Which is just of course way off that pillar of them speeding and not taking a lunch break to get done really, really quickly. Our next story is by Star Hunter. You want to give me in-school suspension where I have to spend the day by myself in a classroom? Okay, that works. Bit of background here. I went to a religious boarding school for high school, and one of the things we had to do was go to prayers every day on time. I won't explain in full the consequences of tardiness or absence, there was a whole point system, etc., but if you did it enough, you got in-school suspension for a day. Basically, you had to sit in a classroom from 9 to 7, minus lunch and afternoon prayers, and you couldn't leave. They gave you one assignment, an essay on why you were tardy slash absent so much, but anything else to keep yourself not insane was your responsibility. No music or phones were allowed either. So eventually this happened to me, and I was taken to the classroom after breakfast, given my assignment, and that was it. The assignment took me maybe two hours to do, so now I have another seven-ish hours to learn my lesson? Well, anything to keep myself not bored. An example, schoolwork, books, works. Since I didn't give a crap about falling behind in the morning classes, I read a book, and in the afternoon, I reviewed for a math test, finished all my math homework, wrote an essay, read another book, and by that time, my suspension was over. So, for following the rules, I had a pretty functional day with no class. I guess that is a very positive thing, you can just get all the work out of the way, you're completely up to date, but if that was me and I had to be in there for all those hours by myself, I definitely think I would start going a little loopy. And I think really that's the heart of the punishment. Most people are expected to not be able to fill all of those hours up being productive or keeping their minds sufficiently occupied. AKA, you won't want to get in school suspension again. This next story is by Siza. Siblings will get along if they share? Let's test this theory. Not my story, but my dad's. So this happened somewhere around the early to mid 1950s. My dad, then aged six, and his sister, then aged four and a half, fought like cats and dogs, especially when it came to sharing food. My grandmother's solution one day for sharing a treat like a candy bar was to have one sibling split it and the other sibling pick which side they wanted. My dad was told to split for his sister, but he saw an opportunity. Knowing she would always pick whichever was more, my dad divided it perfectly in half, down to the crumb. She looked at them and scaled, but it was a perfect split. Since she didn't have a bigger piece, this drove her crazy, so she threw a tantrum. Then grandma punished her for not sharing, and my dad got the whole bar in the end. I mean, fair is fair, right? Splitting a candy bar is totally fair, just take perfect halves. Ain't no room for anybody being a spoiled little brat like that. Good on the grandma for teaching them what's what. This next story is by Panface. You want me to stop what I'm doing and do this other thing? So this happened several times at my job. Still at it, over a few years. I work at Kroger and was in the drug GM department after being transferred there for no reason from grocery slash dairy. So fast forward a few months, I'm working a pallet and a half of product on the floor to carts and then to the shelf. We had an area we could hide the pallets out of the way of customers so we didn't have to work in the congested back room all the time. I'm minding my own business, doing my job when my store manager comes over and gets mad. Why are you over here instead of in dairy? Oh, well, this is my department, so, you know. Stop what you're doing and get over in dairy, there's no one there. A little more backstory. We have lost at least three dairy managers in the course of a year for various reasons. One of the full-time day shift workers quit on the spot, and I would frequently get yelled at for taking too long to clean up when told to go to another department out of the blue. So I get told to go to dairy. Okay, what do I do? I leave everything on the sales floor. 
a half-worked pallet, two U-boats half full, a bunch of empty boxes, plastic wrap, and a pallet jack. I work in dairy for the rest of my shift, six hours, and then go home. The next day, why'd you leave all that crap on the sales floor? Well, you yelled at me for taking too long to clean up, so I just did what you told me. Maybe next time don't do that? This was six years ago. Since then, I have many, many more malicious compliance stories I can share. Just when you thought working retail was bad enough because of the bad customers you have to deal with, you end up having store managers from time to time like this that makes the whole experience doubly worse. Good on OP for sticking it out so long dealing with that. And our final story of the day is by long-suffering squid, Hanging Chad. Had the story from a friend, but I'll tell from first-person perspective for clarity. I work in a manufacturing facility. I've been there long enough to learn how to do almost everything, so I'm often asked to fill in, troubleshoot, and train new people. We had a new person transfer into the department. I've worked with him before and trained him on a few things. Let's call him Chad. At the current time, I am assigned to Station 2 and Chad is assigned to Station 3. To be clear, I am not the boss of either station. Station 3 is one of the few I'm not entirely familiar with. I know how to bypass it, but for some reason management and quality control don't like it when I do that. Something about being non-compliant and the bypass taking longer than doing it the right way in the first place. Chad is friends with people in management, so he occasionally goofs off. The rest of us, being team players, will pick up Chad's slack, but we're getting tired of it. Along comes crunch time. The rest of the team is pulling 60-hour, 6-day work weeks, but Chad is married to his normal 40-hour, 5-day work week. We're falling behind, so it should be all hands on deck. Unfortunately for us, both management and Chad value their weekends. An order comes in. Station 1, no problem. Station 2, a little messy, but nothing unusual. It's Station 3's normal responsibilities to clean up a bit. I pass the order to Chad in Station 3. Station 3, problem. It's a rush order, the end of the day, but Chad wants to go home. Well, I say end the day, but the rest of us will be pulling a couple hours of overtime. Chad could pass the order off to someone else at Station 3, but then they'll get credit for it. However, if he pushes it back into my hands and I have to force the order to bypass Station 3, the system will register him as having processed it. So, as expected, Chad approaches me with, Can you take care of this for me, bro? I've got places to be. It'll look bad for the department if this doesn't get done. Just do your job. I give Chad a look, thinking, 1. Management hates when I bypass stations. 2. I also got places to be, bruh, but I'm still staying here for another 2 hours. 3. I'm not the boss. It may look bad for the department, but it won't look bad for me. 4. I finished my job the instant I handed this order off to you. 5. I am getting supremely tired of Chad's BS, so... I smile a hard, bright smile. Sure thing, Chad. I'll just do my job. Enjoy your weekend. Chad leaves. I go back to my work at Station 2, and the order in question sits on Chad's desk at Station 3, undone for the entire weekend. Turns out this order was for an important client. It also turns out Chad had gotten scheduled Monday and Tuesday off due to his friends in management. A four-day weekend during crunch time when everyone else is pulling six-day work weeks. To say management was angry would be inaccurate. They were approaching incandescently furious. On Wednesday, Chad came in and was immediately pulled into a meeting where he was cut down, chewed up, reamed out, told he better shape up or they were going to ship his butt out. There was no help for Chad from his friends and management. Higher managers had started to take note of the exceptions being taken on Chad's behalf and Chad's friends were looking to cover their own butts. Chad comes to me sullenly. I don't know why you didn't just do the darn thing. But Chad, I protested, I did what you told me to. I just did my job. You can't have your cake and eat it too. 
It was really one or the other for Chad, either get credit for the work and do it and stay there, or pass it off to someone else at Station 3 and enjoy your weekend. He could have gotten to go home and enjoy his weekend and not have any problems with it. But because they wanted to take advantage of somebody else for their own gain, they ended up screwing themselves when that person, understandably, didn't come through for him. And while you might be able to rely on friends and management, they can't always carry you through absolutely everything. You're gonna have to take care of things yourself at some point. You are too important to take the first aid class? Have fun failing the test. This happened in 2018. My husband and I own a company that works with companies to provide doctors and nurses for factories and construction, OSHA, and first aid training and some other things. One of our major accounts is a power company. We not only provide on-site personnel, but also train them on first aid. This particular company is very strict on their health and safety protocols. They require all their crews to have an up-to-date first aid certificate and they had shelled a decent amount of money to equip each of their sites, including their offices, with two AEDs, Automatic Electric Discharger. We were also required to provide an adjusted training for their staff and crews. Because of the nature of the job, we trained them in three hours slash two days schedule. One day was theory, because in a factory environment, instead of A, B, C, U, E, A, B, C, with a written test at the end, and the next day was practical exam. We were scheduled for a two-day training with this company. We were told it would be a small class, around 40 people. So I booked myself and our senior trainer. We arrived for training, set up, get the roll call, and there was when it happened. Cast. John is our senior trainer. Karen is very important person. Walk is me. Chad is COO. As I said, this company is very hardcore on their health and safety. Except from the crews, they require every person that has even the slightest chance of visiting a power plant to have a current first aid certificate. This means we trained a lot of suits. As the room is filling up, I notice John talking with a woman I didn't know. The conversation is heated and I approach to see what's happening. I say, is everything okay? Karen says, no, it's not. As I was saying to this man, I don't need to take the class. I did first aid in my previous company and I have very important work. Yes, you could actually hear the capital letters to do. John says, as I explained, madam, we follow the company policies about training, but I already know everything. I say, madam, your manager booked you for the class. He provably thinks it's more important than anything else. No, I'm very high in the company. If you don't release me immediately, you may lose your contract. At that point, she looked at us with crossed arms and a smug face. John, being a no-nonsense former trainer for the Army's Medic Corps, was ready to explode. Cue malicious compliance. There was a rule for the training set by the company that any personnel that could provide an up-to-date certificate could sign a waiver for the in-person training, but they had to take the test. I quickly provided this as an option to Karen. She wasn't completely happy, but she took it. I explained that there were two tests, one in writing, one practical. She said fine and to notify her when it was time to take them. So, two and a half hours later, she is sitting to take the written test. Immediately, I can see she is struggling, since most of the questions are tailored for an industrial setting. The test ends and we collect the papers. At a quick glance, I knew she had, at best, passed with a very low grade. Despite her struggling in theory, she just came for the test the next day. In this case, I knew she was going to fail. Along with their normal CPR, we had added an AED training, per company rules, and despite being a fairly easy and straightforward machine to use, she had serious trouble. So we pack up, go back to base. We rate the tests, and as expected, she was the only one who had failed both spectacularly. From the rest of the 39 people, only one had failed the written test. We sent the results and certificates to the company. Aftermath 
Monday morning, just after we opened, I got a call from Chad, the company's COO. He is one of our major contracts because training was part of his responsibilities. The call went like this. Good morning, OP. I'm calling about the results of the training. I say, good morning, Chad. I had a feeling you would call. Can you tell me why my assistant COO failed? Is Karen your assistant? Yes. Well, she said she had very important work to do and already had a certificate and she signed the waiver. Of course she did. I could hear the frustration in her voice. Can we arrange a quick training for today? I want you to do it. Let me check. It has to be a late one, otherwise tomorrow at 10. Chad, after some thinking, Tomorrow then. See you at the office. The next day rolls up and at 10 sharp, I'm in the offices. I'm led to a conference room, glass all around, and told to wait. A few minutes later, Chad and Karen step into the room. She looked chastised. She sat across me while Chad stood. Chad asked for the waiver, which I handed to him. He took a look at it and gave it back. As I explained when you were hired, you had to pass this training. The certificate you gave us was coming up and you came from a different field. Now do the training properly and pass it. It is one of the prerequisites for the job. Karen took the training properly this time and passed. Since then, she has never complained about first day training again. Let me ask you guys. When there's situations like this where you're trying to give a whole crop of employees first aid training and an employee says that they already did have first aid training in their background, do you think that they should still have to go through the first aid training regardless of any proof of prior first aid training? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Minotaur2. Tell me not to come in if I don't comply. Okay, deal. This happened a long time ago at a company we'll call The Company with a plant manager we'll call Richard. Richard was paid production bonuses and in his infinite wisdom, greed, he told his superiors that we could get out more production than two plants our size could get out reasonably. With the aging equipment he refused to replace or repair, we were getting seriously behind and now needed to run 24-7 just to stay as behind as we already were. A side note here, our handbook stated quite clearly that Sunday work was strictly voluntary and was to be requested by the supervisor by Thursday at lunch. Needless to say, attendance on Sundays was abysmal at best since many of us had families and other important things to do in our life. Richard decided this wouldn't do and called a plant-wide meeting on one particular Thursday right before lunch. It has come to my attention that many of you are abusing, yes he actually said that, the Sunday voluntary workday status, so I am changing this effective immediately. He didn't have that authority. So if any of you choose not to come in on Sunday, don't bother coming back on Monday. Understand? I say, are you serious? Yes. Okay. With a crap-eating grin. For clarification, we were working two shifts, 12 hours each round the clock at this point, and apparently he had this meeting with them as well. Fallout. Me and about three others got together and all decided to give him what he wanted. We didn't come in on Sunday or Monday. By Monday morning, around 7 a.m., my phone was blowing up with texts and missed calls. Finally, I answered, and it was Richard asking me, Where the heck are you? I politely said, Enjoying my day off. Thanks again. Richard yelled back, What do you mean day off? You are supposed to be here. I said, No, you told us that if we didn't come to work on Sunday, not to come in on Monday. And frankly, I thought that was very nice of you to give an extra day off like that. Richard, realizing he's trapped, changed tone slightly. Well, that's not what I meant, and you know it. Now get in here as soon as you can. I said nicely, nope, you can't back out now. Next time, say what you mean. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Then I hung up and turned off my phone. I had a great day playing games on PCs with my wife. 
All I can say is that's a very bold action to do that and call them out like that and just be so blunt with your plant manager like that. I don't know if they even have the capability of firing you directly from them, but that just doesn't seem like the attitude if you wanted to keep that job, although I don't know if OP did or not. This next story is by Yakrena Anarchy. Boss says we can't drive the work truck, so we don't. The title pretty much sums it up. But a long, long time ago in a city not far away, I had a terrible summer job. Right after high school, my friend and I were looking for practically anything to make money and his older brother told us about a job he once had, working for the sky washing windows. Now, this guy owns what appears to be a semi-legitimate business. He has a full shop slash garage where he stores cleaning products, big fancy tubs that use sonic waves to wash blinds in, and a new, at the time, work truck. He's also a hardcore penny pincher and buys the cheapest, crappiest insurance he can on the truck. Initially, when we got hired on, he would meet us at the shop at 7 a.m., give us the work orders and ride out with us for the -the on-the-job training. After a couple of weeks, he would just leave the work orders in his office and then leave us to our own devices. Now, I want to preface with, we weren't lazy, we got paid hourly like $9 an hour, but we commissioned based on the number of individual windows we cleaned in a day, plus how many windows required a ladder. Those paid an extra 50 cents each. So if we knocked out three to four jobs in one day, we could take home approximately $14 to $15 an hour. Another important fact is that this was right after high school. So we were both 18 and for whatever reason, the boss didn't bother to ask or check our hiring paperwork to confirm this. Well, after a month or so, he finds out how old we are and has a come apart. Turns out, his insurance on the truck has a clause that anyone driving has to be at least 25 years old with a clean driving record. No DUIs or anything like that. Or his monthly payment triples. So he makes it very, very clear to us that we are not to drive the truck, and if he finds out we're doing it anyway, he'll fire us and dock any bonus pay from our final checks. Legally, he can do that because it's a bonus, not hourly. I need to drive home the fact that he was so god darn delusional that he never paid attention to anything. So one day we come into the shop and see a stack of about 15 jobs. However, he didn't schedule anyone else. Never actually scheduled himself because he expected the shop to just run itself. Except for the two of us that day. Q malicious compliance. He liked to micromanage, but simultaneously never picked up his phone if we called him. So despite calling him numerous times to let him know we can't do anything, we end up just sitting in the shop and listening to the radio for most of the day. This was also only a year or two after smartphones came out, so things like streaming music and movies or playing games on your phone was essentially non-existent unless you had a spare thousand dollars lying around to buy the fancy new iPhone 2. Fast forward about five hours and he calls one of us to ask how things are going, how many jobs we'd finished and if we needed help to get any completed. We explained that we'd been sitting in the shop all day waiting for him to come in so we could get started. Well, at this point, he goes freaking ballistic and starts just tearing us up one side and down the other about wasting his time and money and blah, blah, blah. Why didn't you call me? Who else is there? Has anyone finished any of the jobs? Needless to say, that was our last day there but we threatened to report him if he didn't pay us for the time we sat in the shop that day, so we still got paid almost a full day's wages, and from what I heard, within a year or so later, his shop folded. So, win-win, I guess. I mean, besides the whole you-can't-drive-the-work truck thing, it sounded like it wasn't that bad of a gig. Was it really that bad that you were just willing to just toss it away so easily? I mean, I guess it was. This next story is by John Alcatraz, waited one year to take my hoodie off. I was in anime club in high school all four years, and every year we got to miss class to go take club pictures for the yearbook. The lady taking the pictures was overworked, probably underpaid, but most of all, she was a real jerk. 
My sophomore year, 10th grade, I was in line with the rest of the club and was told to take my hoodie off. She was very aggressive about it, and while we were trying to be fun and pose, this wasn't a problem for any other club, just the weeaboo nerds like us, I guess. She told us to shut up and put your hands at your sides. So we took our boring picture, all of us frowning. But I waited. I had an idea. Next year, club pictures came, and I made sure I was just wearing a hoodie with no shirt underneath. Same lady, same vitriolic hatred for nerds like us. Take that hoodie off, she said, and I frowned, looked at her, and slowly lifted it off. I was 16 at the time, very tall and very hairy. She looked away and said audibly, what the freak? Before I could get a word in edgewise, she told me to put it back on, and we took the picture as normal. We even got to hold up peace signs, which, as you may know, 2010 weeaboos love. Man, forget anybody that's trying to restrict people from having fun during those years. You only get four years of high school unless, uh, you know, you fail a little bit, but that's another story. You're just kids, you're growing up, you're coming into your own. You need to be able to enjoy those things. Screw anybody that has hatred for any group of kids in high school. Unless the kids are the ones acting like absolute crap, let them have some fun, let them have a good experience in high school. And our final story of the day is by Anum BH, The Tale of 50 Cents. I believe this goes here, but if not, I hope you chuckle. I have been a cashier for years. I'm 20 years old, but I can easily pass as a 16 year old, so sometimes people speak to me in a rude way. Cool, it happens, moving on. Now let's start the story. I ran out of quarters last Sunday, which is a pain. I usually just ask people if they have the change so I can get to the even dollar. Most people try. This particular Sunday, I had a nice lady, she will be NL from here on out, whose total came out to $10.50, but I only had two quarters left. So I asked her. She was not very nice after that. Do you have the 50 cents to round it out? Nice lady looks at me very angry and says, I don't care what you have to do, but I want my 50 cents. I was taken off guard, so I gave her cents and pennies. I stood there and counted all of them. I put them on her hand and quite proudly. She said, seriously? I was like, oh, sorry, I'm out of change. That's definitely a little bit annoying if that happens as a customer, but like, nothing to get nasty or rude about. Most situations like that can be figured out fairly easily if you're just willing to work with them. I'll make the quesadillas exactly as ordered, but you pay the dry cleaners. Back in the beginning of the 21st century, I was working in a cafe slash sandwich shop. It was a 24-7 shop in a prime location, in an area with a lot of uni students and very active nightlife, and the road was a major artery for anyone traveling in or out of the city. When I started, as a first-year uni student trying to make some money, the shop was one of four of a small chain. Gary, the owner-slash-manager, has bought the rights from the original shop. Gary was also doing quality control for the shop because at that point, every shop had separate vendors. Fast forward two years. The original owners decided to incorporate because they have a lot of offers for franchising and a couple of problems with quality control have appeared. So they bought back all the shops and instituted a more centralized approach to vendors. That was good for Gary because he was the owner of the building. So he became basically a salaried manager and got extra income from the rent. Initially, nothing changed. We were still number two in sales, product was good. Then Richard entered the picture. Richard was the new regional manager. The small chain had become big enough to reach national level and the person responsible for quality control. He was considered something of a golden boy, having a business degree and helping with the expansion. The problem came from his ego. You see, Richard had done a cooking workshop that provides a certificate but nothing more and considered himself something of a chef. His first major change was installing a crepe station. Not restaurant quality crepes, but crepes on the go, folded like a triangle. 
that is important for later. While annoying to learn at the beginning, it quickly became one of our best sellers. We usually went over 10 liters of crepe mixture on a slow day. Having success with his first change, Richard decided to apply his chef training and implement some new things. At that point in time, Mexican cuisine was becoming popular in my country, due mostly to cooking shows. Richard decides to ride the trend and starts putting Mexican options on the menu. In reality, that meant two more set sandwiches and crepes, the ones on the board, and a few more customization options for sandwiches and crepes. And here begins the problem. As I said, Mexican cuisine was quite the new thing. Our country's cuisine is way different than the Mexican, especially on the spice level. A lot of the produce used for Mexican food was either rare or non-existent. But Richard, adamant it was another win for him, found a vendor, and the quality started to fail. We started to receive buckets of pre-made chili and queso and jars of pickled jalapenos and pre-made guacamole and pico de gallo dips. Also, blocks of white cheese labeled queso blanco. The queso was an orange paste with some red bits in it. According to Hubby, under a bad light, it could pass for bad queso. And they left a very plastic taste. It reminded me of clay. One taste of that kept me away from Mexican food for a while. The jalapenos weren't jalapenos. They were pickled Thai green chilies, labeled as jalapenos, meaning they were way hotter than expected. I've never tasted the rest, but some adventurous customers that tried them weren't impressed. The only new thing that kind of sold was a plate of nachos, basically because it was Doritos covered in queso. When it was heated, it became an orange liquid, a lot of bacon, and a lot of sausage. We have complained about the quality to Gary, but he couldn't do anything more and Richard doesn't back down. Richard is a bit upset from the low sales. He blames us, you're not pushing them enough, and the customers, those barbarians couldn't recognize a filet mignon from a shank, but he sticks to his guns and then brings corporate to the shop. Richard comes in with four people from HQ, two of them are the owners. They sit and Richard comes and places an order of five quesadillas. It's a self-service shop. I ask how he wants them. Exactly as it says on the board and prepared exactly as I told you, he replies. Okay, sir, I will call you when they're ready, I replied smiling. Now Richard and all his chefy wisdom has given us very specific instructions for the quesadillas. First, to take out of the way, it wasn't a proper quesadilla, it was a crepe. The instructions were, reheat the chili, start the grape, place one and a half ladles of reheated queso, add one ladle of the chili, add a tablespoon of chopped jalapenos, one tablespoon of queso blanco, half a tablespoon of guacamole, and fold. Doing that produced a liquid mess which tried really hard to escape from a thin crepe. We usually reheated the queso only for nachos, especially in a crepe. We put it cold and let it reheat with the plate's heat to avoid the aforementioned mess. Cue malicious compliance. We, me and the other girl working, make five quesadillas exactly as instructed. I took the order to the table, it was corporate after all, and waited for the results. Five people wearing white shirts and suits bite into the quesadillas. The quesadillas almost simultaneously explode, raining melted cheese and red chili on them. Some of them have bitten a jalapeno and the heat is hitting them hard. A few choice words were heard. We brought them two bottles of water for the heat and two full packs of napkins to clean what they could. Let's say the new menu wasn't a blast with HQ. After they left, Richard came back. He was beyond angry. He approached the bench, bypassing the line, it was during one of our rush hours, and made a scene. The following dialogue is a bit censored. You stupid witch, you made me look bad because you don't like Mexican food. You can't even follow basic instructions. The cleaning of your mess will be deducted from your pay. 
and some other more offensive stuff. I was standing there dumbfounded, along with a long line of customers hearing his outburst. And then Gary intervened. Shut the freak up. What the freak did you say? Richard replied. I said shut the freak up. The girls followed your instructions to the letter. Don't try to blame them for your mistake or make them pay for your dry cleaning. I can do what the freak I want, and when I'm finished with them, maybe I'll find another manager for this shop. I would love to see you try. Oh, I will. I will. And he stormed out. Fallout. Immediately, Gary called HQ and notified about what happened. He also gave an ultimatum. If something happened to his staff, the company would need to find a new location. Three days later, we were notified that Richard was fired. While his outburst was the main reason, it was also partially due to one of the owners having a really bad reaction to the jalapenos. A week later, the Mexican menu was removed. During that part, they found out that Richard had used the cheapest vendor for the new menu. The vendor had a reputation for shady practices, which partly explained the weird products. I stayed there until I finished uni and got a job in my field. The Mexican menu made a huge comeback two years before I left. This time, HQ had hired a proper chef to consult and find vendors. Now the ingredients are as authentic as possible and pico and guac are made daily in-house. They also have good queso now, although it took me a long time to try it, and no prepackaged pre-made chili. In fact, no chili at all. My repulsion to Mexican food ended when my husband took me to a proper Mexican restaurant and finally tested a proper Mexican meal. So let me ask you guys, do you feel that any restaurant should be able to get away with having frozen food? Like in this case, I'm assuming the guacamole, the pico de gallo, the chili probably, they were all pre-made frozen stuff. Should every restaurant in your opinion serve fresh food with never frozen ingredients? Or are some places like fast food chains okay or is it okay in just general? Let me know in the comments down below. And our final story of the day is by Cole Carmet. Just give them the test? Okay then. Another story from my time as a first aid instructor. Hurrah! Just as a quick introduction, at the time this story took place, I was the youngest instructor within the brigade. At age 16, teaching people that were sometimes three times my age. However, as the youngest instructor, I was often the first choice when younger students were being taught for a course. That was the case in this session. This story comes from when I was co-teaching a rather large class with one of the master instructors for the brigade. Our students were a brigade of Navy cadets and their captain sergeant. I don't know ranks honestly but this guy might as well have been a drill sergeant with the way he was treating the cadets. We will call this fellow Kevin simply because I can't think of a creative name for him. The course was a short one, CPR with AED training roughly a three hour course with one break. We go over the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, choking, CPR, CPR in a pair, and how to use the automated external defibrillator or AED. The instructions we got from their command were extremely specific as this was the military and had to follow exact instructions. For context, the master instructor was the first aid instructor for this base before anyone asks. Technically, Kevin outranked him, and I guess that makes me a civilian consultant? We got through the first part of the class with little issue, but Kevin was being a jerk towards us instructors, telling us it wasn't necessary to say that. That's common knowledge. Obviously, he didn't want to be there. I wish I can say this isn't a common thing to experience while teaching these shorter lessons, but I'd be lying. After the break, we were going to be teaching the AED and then have the final test. Kevin wasn't having it. The AED literally walks you through every single step. There is no need to go over it. It is true that AEDs do have voice directions instructing the user exactly how to use it and visual references on the pads themselves on where to put them on the body. 
There are no settings on the AED other than the volume of the machine. It does all the readings themselves and adjusts accordingly. In all terms, they are designed so that anyone can use them and in some parts of Canada, you don't actually need a certification to be permitted to use them. However, as explained, this is technically a military course and we needed to teach exactly the way the higher-ups tell us. We tried to explain that to Kevin, but he said, Just give them the test. As the master instructor was a lower rank than him, he had to obey. However, when the Kevin turned away to go have a smoke during the break, the master instructor took the remotes for the AED out of the cases and threw one to me. I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. For context, the AEDs we used for training are not real AEDs. They are nothing more than glorified tape recorders that cost almost $500 per unit, plus the replacement pads. All they do is light up, convey the instructions on how to use it, and then it waits for two minutes to repeat the cycle. However, the remote for this thing is where things get interesting. One remote works on the nearest AED to it, not just the one it comes with. With the remote, we can simulate complications with the AED. Low batteries, moisture on the pads, too much hair on the body, no shock required. The AED is pretty much plug in and use, but it is also intelligent enough when it was too dangerous to deliver a shock, and we were going to simulate that. Normally, we don't use these remotes for the final test, they are normally just used to show the different failures the machine can have and how to fix them, but the master instructor seemed to want to stick it to Kevin. We applied a little moisture to the training dummies, and when the students returned from the break, we explained we were going to the hands-on test at their sergeant's request. We explained that the AED would walk everyone through how to use it and handed them out. They were required to do 5 minutes of CPR in pairs for the hands-on test while using the AED, showing they are capable of doing it. We let them get through the first set of compressions and had the AED activate once, and then we started using the remote. Suddenly, all the AEDs were freaking out, alarms everywhere. Wee-oo, wee-oo, moisture, moisture kept echoing through the room. Kevin asked us what was going on, but Master Instructor simply said, you told us to give them the test, so we did. Only one of the pairs out of the 20 were able to understand what was happening and took the towel that was provided to them in the AED kit and dry off the training dummy before continuing their 5 minutes. Two students passed. 38 students failed that course. The master instructor told me that Kevin got chewed out by his superiors after he had to explain to them and our organization why nearly everyone in the course failed. Two weeks later, I was asked to return to the base and help teach the lesson again. Another easy paycheck, nothing to complain about there. The drill sergeant was there again, but he was strangely quiet and we got through the lesson proper and half the time it took when Drill Sergeant was interrupting every five minutes. As an added bonus, Kevin was so impressed by the class, he purchased pocket CPR masks for everyone in the class with his own money using the order form provided in the back of the first aid handbooks, giving me a fat commission check for the course as well. Master Instructor told me that the superiors insisted the full commission went to me for being a civilian putting up with Kevin, or something along those lines, I don't recall exactly why. Either way, more cash for me, and no complaints from me. Honestly, I feel like if there's one class you want to skip, it really shouldn't be a first aid class. If there's ever a moment where you can at least brush up on something you can use to try and save someone else's life in a dire moment, that's a really important and great thing to learn, brush up on, re-strengthen your mind, your grasp on it. I'm glad that by the end of the story, Kevin had a total change of heart and totally embraced it. This looks like crap! I had a window washing company in northern Arizona 20 years ago. Did pretty good business and most customers were very pleased when I got finished with their windows, except one old lady. 
I spent about three hours crawling through bushes and risking life and limb to get to high windows with my ladder on a slope. Then moving furniture with her nagging me about not dripping on her window seals, etc. I was meticulous when I cleaned and got all the screens, windows, sills, and tracks washed and working. Her windows made the water black. We had agreed on $300 for the job. I gave her my kind-hearted old lady discount. When I was finished, I asked her for payment. She refused. I told her about our agreement. She refused. I showed her the contract she had signed three hours previously. She still refused. She said I moved all of her furniture out of place and stomped through her fragile bushes and to top it off, the windows looked like crap. Q malicious compliance. I walked down the street to a neighbor's pasture, picked up a few very wet cow pies, and brought them back. Then I started spreading them over her prominent front windows, making sure to cover every piece. She went ballistic as I got ready to leave and called the cops. When the cops showed up and heard the story, both sides, they had a good laugh and sent me on my way. Seems she had a habit of not paying, then calling the cops to get rid of the trespassers. They loved that I just gave her what she wanted. So if somebody did this to you, regardless of who it was, would that inspire you to reach out to any other person you could that works in a similar field or a similar fashion or any kind of platform you can reach out to and explain that this person should be blacklisted? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Devant Tendency. You got what you ordered, Sergeant. Iraq, 2004. Me and my buddy were headed to the chow hall to get some food, and one of my E5 supervisors, who was in a very heated spades game, stopped us and asked where we were going. We responded, Chow. I then made an attempt to vacate the area as fast as possible due to a strong mutual dislike between us. The fewer words I spoke to him, the better. He then told me specifically by name and rank to bring him back a to-go box. Okay, what do you want in it, Sergeant? I don't care. You sure? Just get me a to-go box, specialist. Roger, and moved out. Now, I initially planned on filling it up with the nastiest crap I could find at the chow hall and fill it full of whatever slimy overcooked veg and meat slop they had, but it was a good 500 yard walk back, and I didn't want to have to carry that glop laden leaky styrofoam to go box back only to have them toss it. Q malicious compliance. Yep, just a to go box is exactly what I grabbed for him. I knew he was gonna be pissed, and at that point, I didn't care. What were they going to do? Send me to Iraq? I got back, set his to-go box down right in front of him. He opened it and the look on his face was gold. One to-go box as you ordered, Sergeant. I might as well have spit the last word out. The three others playing the game of spades immediately began laughing, as did the others watching. He proceeded to tell me to get in the front-leaning rest, push-up position, when one of the others playing piped up with, how you gonna smoke him for giving you exactly what you asked for? He fumed for a few seconds, recover and freak off. I quickly got up and continued to chuckle as I left the area. The repercussions were the worst. Guard shifts, crap details, but still was totally worth it. You did get exactly what they asked for. They just said a to-go box and you asked what they wanted in it, and they said they don't care. Well, they sure seem to care when you brought it back. This next story is by Soft White Clouds. Military instructor rages after giving explicit order. When I was slightly younger, I spent a summer doing infantry training in the Army Reserves. One of my section's instructors was unpopular and a bully. I had seen him jack up several younger troops over the course of the summer under what I thought were unfair circumstances. Even his co-instructor didn't like him, we could tell, though he was professional enough to never say anything in front of us. Cue the final exercise near the end of the course. Another troop from my section had been sent to a simulated ambush location overnight. We spent hours in damp grass waiting for first light. We were a cutoff team and were watching a road where another section would march past and get ambushed. Cam and concealment were key. 
About a half hour before their arrival, Master Corporal Unpopular comes by to check on the welfare of me and my fire team partner. We are well concealed with good observation of the target roadway. He has trouble finding us but eventually does and tells us brusquely to stand up. I assumed at the time he just meant for a little while to get off the cold ground before first light. But since that was the only order he gave us, and he had been a Richard head all summer about people not following his orders, we took him literally. We stood up and remained standing until the enemy marched by, looked at us in confusion, and the ambush was triggered, while the enemy officer complained about those two troops standing in the grass off in the distance. The instructor yelled at us afterwards for a bit, we repeated his last order to us, and he went off presumably to allow his head to finish exploding somewhere else. We passed the course, we didn't much care, and never had to deal with him again as we were from different units. I'm glad they passed the course at least. I mean, they obeyed the only order they were given, right? They didn't clarify even though they probably should have known to get back down. Just glad it wasn't a bad ending. This next story is by Windsign99. Well, if that's how you want it, I'll let you do it. So for backstory, a department manager position was posted at my work but required something I didn't know anything about. I informed my store manager I was interested but knew I may not get it due to the one requirement and yeah, I didn't. Since it was the only real requirement, I let it go. Basically, someone got the job from outside the company since other than that one task, I would have been the best person for the job. Again, I let it go, wasn't really the department I wanted, it was just a better title. This person, let's call him, I don't know, Jack. Well, Jack was okay at first during training, but soon became the employee that even now, we use his name when someone does something wrong. Basically, we were trying to clean up his messes, even having to change tags that he did wrong. Again, even to this day, we are changing his tags and this was years ago. All tags have the employees' numbers of who printed them on them so we know. So you understand what kind of person this person is. The only thing he was actually good at was the one and only thing he got the job because of. So here is the malicious compliance story. Basically, like I said, I was always cleaning messes up for him, in this case, I mean it literally. I close with him a lot and it's retail, so we need to clean up and face our departments each night. Every time he closed, he would just clean the one section he knew really well and left the rest of his department a mess and then would leave. Me being the helpful type, seen this and without thinking just cleaned his department too, thinking it happened after he left. Oh yeah, did I mention he left early? I usually had to stay a little late, but it needed to be done. After a while, I wondered why he was getting away with this, so I asked the closing manager on duty. He said he didn't know since he had the front to close and had no complaints from the morning managers about any messes. Yeah, because I was cleaning it. He said he would watch for it and asked if I would let him know if it happened again. Yep, it happened again. So I let them know and he said go ahead, talk to Jack before he leaves and ask him to finish. Mind you, I am not a manager yet and have no authority to stop him from leaving, but the other manager had to count and close the registers and it didn't matter since they were both managers. So I went, asked Jack and he said it was fine since he worked the next day, he would take care of it then and not to worry about it, and he was kind of rude. I thought to myself, that would be stupid of him to do, didn't he know the store manager comes in almost two hours before we open, let alone before he would show up? But I got a big grin and said, okay. Here is the malicious compliance. I informed the front manager what I was told and that I was told to not worry about it and told him that is exactly what I was going to do. He had the same thought I did as I said it. He replied with a big grin also, yep, then I won't worry about it either. So we stopped worrying about it, and if we found another employee cleaning his area, we told them that he said not to worry about it, he will clean it. And each employee we said that to got a big grin and went back to their department. Remember, Jack was not really liked and made messes we all had to clean up to this day, except you know, not this time. His department was left a mess each night he closed. 
Two weeks later, I was lucky to be on shift and walk past my store manager and another store's manager talking. They were talking about Jack. Talking about how he used to be good at cleaning the department each night and not sure what happened, as it's been a mess for several weeks and they had to clean it up each morning. I couldn't help it. I laughed out loud. Both turned to look at me. That's when I told them that I was the one who was cleaning his department till he told me not to worry about it and he was leaving early. Then at the same time they looked at each other with that, oh that makes sense, light bulb look. I told them everything, including some of the messes we are still fixing. Some of which they knew and was only keeping him because his department was staying clean and that one task he was hired for was getting done but when he stopped cleaning his department, well, I can bet you understand what they were talking about. Well, long story short, I don't know exactly what swayed the vote, but he was fired and we all had to learn new codes for all the secure areas of the store and we don't usually change them. So I'm guessing something happened. Anyway, I was given his department to manage and they taught another employee who knew something about the task to do the task. To be fair, if I had to clean up after them every night, I'd get pretty pissed off. I wouldn't want to be staying there extra time cleaning up a mess that I'm not even supposed to be responsible for. I'd probably have complained way harder than OP did. Our next story is by Vengeful Contabase, Combo Meals. So I work at an undisclosed popular drive-in restaurant that shares the name with a certain speedy hedgehog. At our location, Mountain Town number 5490, your order taker rings up everything individually, then hits a Find Combos button that automatically places your food into combos and saves you money. As I'm sure anyone that has ever worked fast food can tell you, customers suck sometimes. On multiple occasions, I have had to explain to customers that even though they did not specifically ask for a combo, they are receiving one anyway because it saves them money. Only about a dollar and eight cents US per meal, but money is money. After I tell them it saves them money, their entire attitude changes and they're now satisfied with their order. However, when the customer is being particularly difficult, then raises a stink about not asking for a combo, I just uncombo the order. Gives me some small satisfaction doing exactly what they ask me to do. By the way, all my managers think it's hilarious and are now adopting this method of dealing with problem people. I love my crew. It's small and in the grand scheme of things doesn't really do a whole lot unless they're buying a lot of food and you can uncombo a lot of stuff, but it's still something where you know that they're getting ripped off and they asked for it and you can get a little bit of satisfaction out of that. This next story is by True Madness. You want breakfast? Okay. This is not my story, but rather my mother's. This is what she told me with a bit of additional info on my behalf. This happened many years back the 2000s to put it in perspective. My little sister at the time was a brat. Had to have the best clothes, best things in life, always chatting with her friends on our mobile. Well, one morning, my mom got a text message from my sister, who was in her bedroom, three rooms away, asking for her to make her some breakfast. My mother took a breath and replied, okay, what do you want? My sister responded with an egg, bacon with a muffin. This was Sunday special with my mother making her own McMuffin. So my mother did. She got a plate, placed an unopened egg, a piece of cold bacon, and a muffin, walked into my sister's room and placed it in front of her. You didn't cook it, my sister states. My mother says, you didn't specify, and left. Needless to say, my sister never asked my mother for breakfast through a text ever again. This is the kind of story that makes you take a step back for a second and make you kind of realize how modern day technology can be kind of disappointing in some ways. There's so many times now where that human connection is removed just because it's easier to type some letters out on a keyboard. Obviously right now it's for the best, but in the grand scheme of things, you kind of wish that sometimes there was more human connection rather than just a text message. And our final story of the day is by Patalik. Sure. I'll text when I'm here. 20 years ago, my brother lived by himself about an hour away from where my mom and I lived. 
I'm much younger than my bro, so was still a child while he was a late teen. We lived in a rural area, while my bro was in the nearest city. Whenever my mom had needed to go into the city, she would pick him up and they'd just spend time together. He had a really bad habit on these occasions. To wait until she was already there and then get out of bed, shower, get dressed and then meet her outside for them to go do whatever they were doing that day, either errands or shopping, etc. This process would take anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour, which would eat into the time mom was willing to spend in the city. One day, mom arranged to see him and he just said, okay, just text me when you're here. The next day, she texted him, I'm here, as she was leaving her house, an hour away from my bro. So my bro got up, got showered and dressed and went to stand outside looking for her car. After waiting for about 15 minutes or so, he finally rang her to find out where she was parked. Parked? I'm not parked anywhere, I'm still driving. But you texted me you're here. I am here. You're there. I will be there in about 15 minutes. Are you ready? Yes, I've been ready for 15 minutes and waiting outside for you. Oh good, I won't have to wait this time. See you in a moment. On that occasion, mom was able to get on with her day immediately. In the future, my bro did end up being dressed in time for mom getting there, but he is still perpetually and habitually late to this day 20 years later. We still talk about this text every time bro is late though. I mean, that's just smart. If you know that they never get up on time and you're always waiting 10 to 15 to even 30 minutes for them to get ready, give them a text ahead and say you're already there so you just go ahead and bypass that time on the way over. It was pretty ingenious, it seemed to resonate with them because they completely fixed their whole issue of not being ready when they got there, and it seemed to improve the experiences for the mom going forward, which is great. Don't want me to fix the servers? Fine. Background. Sometime around 2000, I worked for a major finance slash brokerage company in the IT department. I worked the overnight shift alone and, among other things, my responsibilities included monitoring of the company's most important servers, including the trading servers, as well as performing almost all repairs on these servers since my shift was the least impactful on business. These servers were how every trade from every broker worldwide was processed on behalf of clients. We had 8 servers all behind a load director. For those non-IT people, think traffic at an intersection with a cop letting vehicles know which way they can go. At the time, I reported directly to one of the assistant vice presidents for IT. Cast is simply me, Don, the assistant vice president, and Kathy, vice president. So at some point doing my job, I begin to notice issues with our trading servers. I determine the cause, come up with a plan to repair the failing parts. On the first night of the week, I will take down two servers, repair them, bring them back up, and put them back behind the load director. I will repeat this for the next three nights, allowing all eight servers to be repaired with minimal impact and have the last night of the week in case anything goes the way of the toilet. Understand that while I had authority to do this with just about any of the other thousand plus servers the company had, I could not touch these without the Don's approval. So I send an email to the Don detailing the problem, the parts I needed to order, the plan, etc. All I needed from her was a response that said, approved, and I would have everything completed within two weeks. Also note that I had read receipts turned on for all my emails. As you can probably guess, I heard nothing back. Two weeks later, I follow up with another email reminding her of the issue and including all the documentation I had sent with the first one. Nothing. Another two weeks go by and I send a second follow-up email noting that this isn't a question of if these machines will fail, but only a matter of when. Crickets. Another two weeks go by. It is now about noon on Friday and I am home having just begun my weekend. I get a call that goes something like this. Hello? Kathy says, is this OP? I say yes. They say, this is Kathy. I say, who? When I'm off the clock, that part of my brain turns off. It's Kathy, your boss. Oh, hey, Kathy, what's... Oh, this cannot be good. 
I am now realizing that my boss's boss is calling me at my house and that all the excrement must have followed an upward trajectory towards the device circulating air. Kathy says, all the trading servers have crashed. We need everyone on hand. I say, I'll be there in 20 minutes. It was usually a 35 minute drive. Basically, one server crashed and the load from that server was transferred to the remaining seven, which caused number two to fail under the increased load. Rinse and repeat for all eight servers. I arrived at work to find the entire team is there with eight brand new servers ready to be built. We get everything built, locked down, restored from latest backups and online again by 6 p.m., then home for the weekend. I get to work Sunday night, my Monday, and the first thing I do is print out emails in those oh-so-precious read receipts. I place them in a nice folder on the corner of my desk. At 7 a.m. Monday morning, end of my shift, Kathy walks into my office and asks me to join her in her office. I say sure and grab the folder and follow her. When we get to her office, present are me, Kathy, Dawn, and a lady from HR. Kathy says, so OP. I understand from Dawn that it is your job to monitor the trading servers. Can you tell me what happened? I say sure. Opens folder. As you can see from this email dated so and so, highlighted for your convenience, I notified Dawn of the problem and requested approval to go ahead with the fix. Here, opens folder again, is the read receipt showing she read it the following morning at so and so a.m. Again, highlighted for your convenience. Rinse and repeat for the other emails. Kathy says, okay, thank you OP, have a good night, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Fallout. The company lost a stupid amount of money making good on every single trade that didn't happen due to the crash. I came back to work that night to find out from the team that Don was gone. I never told them the details. I was assigned to the backup contingency planning team and later to the team that implemented the BCP so that something like this would never happen again. We got a new assistant vice president. So if you found yourself in this situation where you're trying to email your boss for approval on this project and they're actively reading the emails you can see that and they're not responding, would you want to play the petty game and let everything crash and have the boss be completely responsible for not doing their job or do you think you would be the type of person in that situation to seek out the boss in person and tell them to their face that they need to approve your request? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Get Us The Sea. Next week, I'm going to fire you. Works for a crappy airline company. Let's just make up a name, United Blair Lines. At this company, they started a smaller company that could hire and train people to run planes, but pay them way less at certain airports, where my colleagues at other airports were making over $20 an hour, I was getting paid $10.25 for the same and sometimes more work. It honestly would scare you to know how little the people who are the ones that make sure your plane takes off safely are paid. All of us had two to three jobs to be able to pay rent and we were all in the job for the benefits, free flights to anywhere in the country on standby. Anyway, I had a boss, we'll call him Jim. I could tell many stories on how terrible of a boss he was, but this one has actual malicious compliance. I had to go to the hospital from the airport because of intense pain in my stomach. It turns out that because of stress caused by that job, my intestines decided to stop functioning. Anyway, I spent the day in the hospital and then they gave me a note saying that I didn't have to work the next two days. I told Jim's boss that, since I hated talking to Jim. When I went back into work three days later, we had five people total to load all luggage, load the water, and push out five planes in little over an hour. Already an incredible amount of work for so few people, we had our morning work meeting to discuss how freaked we were, then Jim asked me into his office. Your attendance is unacceptable, he said. Dumbfounded, I asked him what he meant. You've been late a couple of times and now missing the past three days. I said, Jim, I have the note from the hospital. According to work policy, that shouldn't affect my attendance. I don't care what work policy says, I'm going to fire you. 
Again, I cited work policy since we were protected by a union. I said, Jim, you have to give me an attendance warning before you're allowed to fire me for attendance. This is the first time I'm hearing about attendance, so you can't fire me right now. Jim said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you a warning right now, and when I get back from vacation next week, you're going to be fired. Now go back to work. My decision is final. So I told my coworkers what happened. Then I decided, all right, well, if next week he's firing me, I'll just leave now. Even though their day was about to be freaked, since now four people were working five planes. They all said, freak this place, get out of here. So I left and went to get breakfast. This all happened at 4 a.m. As I'm enjoying my meal, Jim calls me. I happily ignore. He calls me three more times and then texts me asking where I was at. I told him, you fired me, why would I keep working for you? No response. I try to soak in the sight of Jim running between planes like a chicken with his head cut off. I don't imagine any plane took off on time that morning. I get a call from HR and the union rep and the general manager who is Jim's boss. They all said Jim was wrong and asked me if I would come back to work it out. But quitting felt so good and I felt such weight lifted off my shoulders thinking about not working there anymore. So I never went back. Some more info, although this isn't so satisfying, it's more a testament of United Blair Line's complete lack of ethics. Jim got in really big trouble when he had a guy who had a shoulder injury and had a note and told Jim several times he couldn't do super heavy labor. Jim sent him to the bag room by himself anyway. Imagine having to lift 300 to 700, 50 to 70 pound bags over your head per hour, all while running between bag carts and the belt. Needless to say, the guy tore his shoulder and had to get surgery on it. They still didn't fire Jim. Instead, they promoted him to manage the workers who did ticketing and no manual labor. As far as I know, Jim still works for United. My coworker still cannot move the way he used to two years later. Well, first off, I'm sure they're pretty bummed that OP left because they were getting you at like slave labor wages for that kind of work. And the poor guy with the shoulder issue is so disgusting. I'm assuming he did it because he needed the money. Otherwise, I don't see why anybody else would try and do that. I feel terrible for that guy. This next story is by Spud Buddy. Be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. Okay, so this happened back in the 90s. After reading some of these, I felt it might fit right in. Background is I was a maintenance worker for a local community. Now, there is about 30 in our group of workers assigned to different departments. I've been bounced around from one to another for various reasons. So I tend to have a smart mouth at times and my replies tend to piss off the bosses. So for whatever reason on this particular day, I somehow, some way pissed off the superintendent, so my boss's boss. He had a long time hard on for me, didn't care much for my attitude, but I always showed up on time and always took any overtime offered, so despite being a smart butt, I was a very capable skilled worker. Now on with the rest of the story. This is really back before cell phones were widely carried. I was pulled for my assignment and told to meet with the super for a new job. Well, we have a community bridge where I worked and the kids used to spray paint graffiti on it constantly, so I was told to paint the bridge. I was dropped off with paint, brushes, rollers and nothing else, so no radio to call for anything. This was in the early part of the day. I wasn't told to bring my lunch or anything to drink. So off I go to paint over the graffiti. I've been painting for a few hours by brush. Since I figured it was a punishment for something, I might as well take my time doing it. The weather was perfect. Now one and a half hours after what should have been my lunchtime, the super drives up, gets out with another boss, and comes to inspect what I've been painting all day. He starts screaming at me, what the freak have I been doing all day? I told him I've been painting like I was instructed to. He calls me a liar and said I've done nothing but freak off all day. 
Well, now that's not true at all, as I did in fact paint the bridge. However, I painted the back side of the bridge that faced out into a field, and not the side that people can view when crossing the bridge. He was so pissed off at me while I looked at the other boss who was laughing, because he knew that I had a habit of doing what I'm told, just not the way they expected it to be done. My response to the super, well, if you wanted me to paint the inside of the bridge, you should have directed me to do so. You said paint over the graffiti, which I did. You however gave me poor directions, and now you're mad about it. P.S. I had to spend the rest of the week painting the entire bridge. I hope you got a chuckle out of it. I have a few more to write when I get a few minutes. I mean, what really can they expect if they know you're a smart bud, you make all these quips, you joke around? They're going to go and set you off somewhere by yourself and tell you to do a job and just trust that it's going to get done exactly right? They should have seen it coming. And our final story of the day is by Lyeth Gray. You want us to bleach the rocks? Alrighty then. So like many people in the military, I too have had leadership entering stupid contests and winning stupid prizes. This time was one of my favorites. Our top, first sergeant, highest ranked non-commissioned officer in a army company, basically a very senior management type, told all the youngins to clean the area around HQ, including washing the whitewashed rocks that were surrounding all the pretty landscaping which was something we had to do about once or twice a month or so. So we're out there with buckets of soapy water washing the stupid rocks when he comes out and inspects and declares that the washed rocks still look dingy and we need to bleach them to get them white again. Then he proceeds to check out and go home for the weekend, leaving us to execute his orders without much in the way of supervision. Our sole junior sergeant who was left in charge wasn't the brightest bulb in the box if you catch my meaning. Now, anyone who knows anything knows bleach ain't gonna do a thing to make a rock change color. What he meant for us to do, and indeed what we should have done, was to repaint the rocks white again. And as it turned out, we didn't have paint, but we did have a couple bottles of Clorox. A couple of soldiers made a token protest, but our genius junior sergeant tells them, Tom told us to bleach the rocks, and we're gonna bleach them. So we spend the rest of our day bleaching the rocks. Top comes back on Monday to a bunch of still gray and dingy looking rocks, and lots of dead landscaping. Turns out, bleach is bad for plants. He was livid. But he had a hard time finding someone to get in trouble for it, since we'd all done exactly what we'd been told to do. The best thing though, was that for the rest of my time in that unit, no one ever told us to wash the rocks again. Personally, if somebody told me to bleach the rocks, I would think that they meant to literally bleach the rocks. I think this whole thing is definitely on the top sergeant. Why would you say bleach the rocks if you mean paint them? That's like two completely different things. He told me to draw faster, so I drew faster. So this is a story from around seven years ago. I was in my first year of college, and I had this subject called engineering drawing, which by the way is kind of irrelevant to my major, electronics and communications. The subject was all about figuring out and drawing all sides of an object by looking at drawings of two sides, or just drawing what a cross section of that object looked like. I was the type who was good at drawing details, but I take my time to avoid any mistakes. So the drawing that takes like 30 minutes with someone else might take around 45 minutes for me. The professor of this subject always gave us assignments during his lecture, which we had to finish in the last 30 minutes of the lecture. And obviously I would still not be finished when time is up, so he would make me stay later than others to finish it then proceeds to nitpick any small mistakes he notices on it while lecturing me about how I should draw faster. Of course, I saw none of the others being treated this way. As long as they say they're done and show a drawing, they can go home without him even taking a closer look. He told me that if I don't work on my drawing and make it faster, I would never pass his subject. Now this professor in particular was known for making the exam drawings take more time than you get, 
We get two hours to finish drawing everything, and we have three drawings that each should take at least 45 minutes to do properly, so the highest grades were around 70 to 80. I'd like to point out that 40 points are for the practical part where we did assignments and 60 for the exam, so that 70 to 80 is how much they get with a max practical grade. Now, I took a look at past exams and I noticed something interesting. Because he puts three drawings, two of them go on one side of the paper and the last one goes on the other side. And since he has a lot of space, the last one is always on a one-to-one -one scale, and we just have to make a cross-section of it, so I knew what I had to do. Fast forward to the day of the exam, I go in knowing what to do. I grab the paper to get surprised by not one, but two questions with a one-to-one -one scale, and the last question was very small and had a bigger scale. My smile grows bigger. I put the answer sheet over the question sheet in a way that lets me see the lines of the drawings, and I just trace the lines, and in less than 15 minutes, the cross-section drawing is done. Only the border lines because I have to add details inside and mark the cut section, but these shouldn't take long. As I'm working on the other question the same way, the professor enters the hall to see if anyone has any questions about the exam, or we have something we didn't understand, and he notices me after a minute or two. He rushes to me and looks closely at my paper, then he picks it up and sees the question paper right below it. He gets visibly angry. What do you think you're doing? Drawing? Why do you have the paper set up this way? Me with a smile. We have no rules against that though. I can put my papers wherever I want. But that's cheating! I'm not using the subject book or cheating notes or even getting answers from anyone around me so it doesn't count. The rules state what is considered as cheating so going by the rules only, I wasn't considered cheating. He realizes that I'm right and I didn't break any rule. Alright then, from now on it's a rule. Don't put answer sheet above question sheet. Okay, I promise I won't do that. Can I have my paper back so I can finish the exam? He returns the paper to me, goes to the guy watching us during the exams, points at me and says, Keep an eye on that guy. Ha! Huh, too late for that. I had already made progress on the second drawing when he caught me, so I was almost done doing this anyway. I actually almost finished two drawings in around 30 minutes, so I had leeway to take my time with the last one and check for any mistakes after I finished drawing everything, and even with that, I finished the exam around 30 minutes before time ended, and went back home satisfied while others thought I was throwing the subject because they needed the full time just to pass it. You need 60% to pass any subject. Thankfully, because in our university the professor can't see the names of the students when grading, I got away with this and got an 85 out of 100 on the subject. I had 25 out of 40 on the practical, which means I got a full mark on the exam part. I told my friends about what I did, and they were surprised that I even thought of doing this. Needless to say, you can't use this plan anymore in my university because the professor stopped using one-to-one -one scale questions and a rule was added to consider this as cheating in any subject that needs a drawing. Whoopsie. The whole time I was reading this, I was thinking about how I can't even draw stick figures properly, let alone full diagrams and cross sections and whatnot. Be honest guys, can you draw it all? Are you good drawers? Let me know in the comments down below. This next story is by E Whiskey M. Don't want 60 seconds of adjustment? Okay. Enjoy waiting six weeks. So I'm a dental assistant for a private practice. Let me just preface this by saying most of our patients are wonderful people. Friendly, happy to see us, respect our professional opinions and recommendations, etc. But literally just like three hours ago, I had the biggest Karen in for what should have been a simple appointment. So when we do crowns, or caps as some people know them as, we prep the tooth beforehand and take an impression. Then that impression goes to a lab and the techs there make the crown. It takes two to three weeks for them to send the crown back. When we deliver the crown to the patient, the doctor and I try the crown in first just to see how it fits. It is very rare that it fits perfectly. We almost always have to make some adjustments. Shaving down the crown here and there, checking the space in between the teeth, checking the bite, etc. All of this is standard. The main thing we use is called articulating paper. 
When the patient bites down on it, we can see heavy blue markings where the bite needs adjusting. The more we adjust, the lighter those marks get and even stop marking altogether sometimes. Most exchanges with the patients are like this. How's it feel? It's a little high. Okay, we'll adjust that. We use the articulating paper, then grind the crown down a little. How's it feel now? Oh, feels much better. Okay, cool, let's cement it in. This takes maybe five minutes at most. This lady we had tonight was having none of it. How's it feel? Uh, it's way off. Okay, we'll adjust it. How's it feel now? The same. Um, really? No change? The same. Okay, no biggie. Let's adjust more. We did this maybe for five minutes, over and over, and she kept insisting that it was exactly the same. No change. Even though the marks were gone at this point, meaning that her teeth were no longer even touching the crown. At this point, we had a couple options which the doctor presented to her. The doctor said, Okay, well, I can keep adjusting the crown. The only issue is that if I keep reducing the porcelain on top, the metal underneath might end up showing. Are you okay with that? No. Okay, well, then I need to make a small adjustment to the tooth above this one so that they don't touch. It's very superficial. No, don't touch my other teeth. We do this all the time, ma'am. It doesn't harm the teeth. We're basically just polishing it. No, that's a lie. If you guys did it correctly the first time, you wouldn't have to adjust it at all. I say, ma'am, we do this for everyone. The lab almost never makes them perfect. We either have to adjust the crown itself or the opposing teeth. No, you screwed up. Well, we have to adjust one or the other, so which would you prefer? Do you want metal showing? No. So we can polish the opposing tooth? No. It'll literally take a few seconds. No, you're lying. It's going to harm my teeth. At this point, the doctor suggested getting our office manager to talk to Karen. Our office manager is an awesome lady. She's old, doesn't give a freak, and is two years away from retirement. I told her the situation, and she laughed and said, Okay, let's make her wait another month. I don't give a crap. So she marched right in there and said, Okay, ma'am, since you don't want this crown, we'll send it back to the lab and have them redo it. So instead of just waiting the 60 seconds for us to adjust, she now has to wait three weeks to come in again. And that's just to re-prep the tooth. Then she has to wait another three weeks for the crown to come back from the lab again. Anyway, thanks for reading. I mostly just wanted to type this out to rant. I've been working as a dental assistant for almost a decade now, and I've never had an exchange like that. It was so bizarre. I straight up think she was either lying to our faces or just crazy. It made zero sense. This Karen was just too woke. You guys clearly made a mistake and she won't let you get away for trying to cover it up by adjusting another tooth for 60 seconds. Dentists of the world, us Karens are after you. You better be careful and get our teeth right and stuff. Our next story is by Complex River. I can't see my mom's oncologist with her. Fine. I'll just sit in the lobby. My mom has stage 4 cancer and has to go into her cancer doctor's office twice a month for med checks and a shot. She also gets seizures and winds up loopy for a day or so after she has one. Her cancer doctor has a strict no recording policy for appointments and now they no longer allow people to go with patients in to see the doctor under any circumstances. Two visits ago, my mom went to the doctor. We told them she had had a seizure earlier that day and that she was still kind of looped from it. We asked that any directions she needed to follow or any important notes from the appointment be given to her in writing. The Karen of a nurse rudely explained that that's not something they do and that my mom would just have to keep track of it herself. My mom can't even write because the cancer has eaten holes in her hand and arm bones. So not really sure what she thought my mom could do. Anyways, they wind up changing her prescription. We find out later from the pharmacy that it could possibly kill her with the other meds the cancer doctor had her on. Mom didn't recall what the doctor had told her about stopping the other meds and starting the new ones. 
Thank God the pharmacist caught it, cause my mom would have just taken them as prescribed and died. Figuring that she needed someone to go with her to the appointment and working within the confines of the office's restrictions, we came up with a solution of sending her back with a walkie-talkie and me sitting in the lobby with the other walkie-talkie taking notes of anything important. We got walkie-talkies that I could plug an earpiece into so it wouldn't be a nuisance to others in the lobby. We were pretty pleased with our solution and felt that it was considerate and respectful of everyone involved as well as mindful of restrictions. Well, Karen the nurse was super duper pissed about it. She went off on me and kept insisting that if my mom was that sick, she should be in the hospital, not a doctor's office. We communicate with her neurologist regularly and she didn't need to be in the hospital. She made a big stink about how walkie-talkies were the same as recording and kept pointing to the no recording sign. She told me that it's not her problem, my mom can't write to take her own notes, and that it's a patient's responsibility to make sure they know and follow the doctor's orders, blah blah blah. So we wound up having to talk to the office manager, who wasn't thrilled with our solution, but agreed to allow it after pointing out that it could affect the level of care my mom gets because having a walkie-talkie on could make the doctor feel uncomfortable. I didn't say anything back, but I had plenty on my mind that I could have said. I was just glad they agreed to follow it. So my mom got to see her doctor, and I got to take notes. The best part of it was that there were three other sets of people I met in the lobby who were stressed about the same thing. One lady was blind and had Alzheimer's and they wouldn't let her daughter back with her. And they thought our solution was very clever. So we may have started a trend of people bringing walkie-talkies or using video calls to go into the cancer doctor. The fact that they can't give you written instructions is insane. What kind of a doctor's place is it regardless of what kind of specialty that they can't give you written instructions? That's like one of the most basic fundamental things of patient care. That would irritate me to no end. If you're going to any kind of medical place and they can't give you written instructions, I would advise you try to find an alternate place to go to if you can, because I think that seems like there's some kind of shady issue going on here, and it likely means that whatever care they chose for you, they don't want on any kind of written record. Why else wouldn't they allow it? And our final story of the day is by Throwaway Again N. Division manager risks safety to save 20 seconds, Sometimes unions do right. I was a part-time supervisor for a package moving company that moves those brown packages. Prior to running an aircraft unload crew, I spent a couple years in the training department training new employees on ramp slash tarmac operations and was very familiar with the air operation manual that covers every aspect of the ramp slash aircraft load unload operations. In that manual, it explains the proper procedure and timing for approaching and putting up the aircraft stairs when an aircraft arrives. One section deals with aircraft that do not have auxiliary power units. Older aircraft that do not have these do not have the ability to open the cargo door without ground power attached. For that reason, when the aircraft comes to a stop, the pilot sets the parking brake and the ground crew blocks the front tires only. At this point, the aircraft is supposed to shut down the engines on the side of the doors. The manual says the ground crew supervisor must visually confirm those engines are shut down prior to anyone or anything approaching the aircraft or putting up crew stairs. One day, I arrive for the supervisor pre-operations meeting and I'm instructed that I must instruct my crew to put up the crew stairs as soon as the front tires are blocked. I tell my supervisor that this isn't the proper operation and he informs me that this comes from the division manager. He tells me, well that is what I was told to do, so that is what I'm telling you to do. I proceed to his boss, the manager, and show him the operations manual and explain that it isn't what it says, and that it is unsafe to approach any aircraft that has engines running. That manager tells me, if you disagree, take it up with the division manager. So I march my butt down to the division manager's office and show him the operations manual and he tells me that because the aircraft is stopped and the front wheels are blocked that the engines on that side are being shut down. So the stairs could go immediately up and ignore the 20 seconds it takes to make sure the engine has spun down and is off. 
I'm told I will do it his way as he is the division manager and that is it. Malicious compliance. Go out to unload the aircraft with my crew and explain that I don't want you to be unsafe, but we are going to put the new rule to the test. I told them all to be ready and to move extra quickly to block the tires as soon as the plane stopped, and as soon as it was blocked, to put the stairs up as fast as possible and be mindful in case something went wrong. I flew up those stairs to greet the engineer that usually, without stairs there, cracks the door so he can peek out and open the cargo door. Needless to say, I scared the crap out of the engineer when he cracks the door and I pull it open and say, hi. Slightly stunned, he says hello and gives me the wait one moment. He opens the cargo door and then waves me inside. He asks me, why are the stairs up and why are you there? I explain what I wrote above to him and he shakes his head and says, oh my god, no. He says, come with me and tell the pilot and co-pilot. I tell them the division manager's reasoning and the pilot says, there are many reasons why I might leave these engines running and that while normally they are shut down as soon as the brake is set, that it isn't always the case. I told him I agreed and I tried to do something about it. Pilot looks at me and says, I got you. I'll walk upstairs right now and threaten to grieve it through the pilot's union. I thank him, and the next day the division manager had changed his mind, and we went back to doing it properly. The division manager didn't know it was me who threw him under the bus for not listening to me. Imagine trying to ignore a rule that most likely was made because somebody was maimed or died because of lack of that rule. That's what the division manager was trying to ignore here. Obviously, OP did exactly the right thing here in trying to force the issue that, hey, this isn't okay, it could hurt somebody, it could kill somebody. It's a good thing OP got it shut down and back to the way it should be. You think you found a shortcut? Think again. Going through the stories here, I realized I have a malicious compliance of my own. I used to work at a software development company for medical professions. Each program had its own help desk, and then there was my team that did the support for the hardware the software ran on. I had the luck that the manager I had at the time would let me do my thing because I am all customer satisfaction and solving problems properly, so he never bothered me too much with these stupid statistics that he got shoved down his throat by upper management. Because of that, my manager also knew that any kind of half butt customer service on my part was definitely warranted. There is a story where he and the rest of my team were signaling me to hang up the phone with an unreasonable customer I kept trying to help. The phone system was set up in a way that most of the customers would be recognized by the system and be routed to the correct help desk. The only choice menu most of them got was if they needed their software help desk or the hardware help desk. Only big flaw in this phone system was that there was no way to put people into the queue of transfer to another queue. The only way to transfer was to check with a colleague if they were willing to keep their line free so I could transfer them. I want to make it crystal clear that I am all about helping and customer service, but I had learned in the past being the person who was the senior member of the team and did the job longer than my direct colleagues and my manager that unfortunately a lot of customers needed to be educated or our little team would have no time for real work because of having to play telephone operator for the other help desks. That's what you get when your team has a pickup rate of 95%. A lot of our customers, especially the general practitioners, had a habit of trying to exploit the system. So on the days the fine people of software had a bit of waiting time, as a result of a lot of people calling, they tried to find a shortcut by choosing hardware and asking us to transfer to software. This was not a real option because the system would instantly connect a person from the software queue to the first available person. As a result of this, I only transferred customers that made a genuine mistake by choosing hardware. Some issues could look hardware related at first glance, but are software issues. No matter what, you choose hardware when you know you need software, you have to call back and choose software. On paper, I had no problem with transferring, but most in reality, you quickly learn that when you give them an inch, they take it all. Flashbacks to the nightmare month where they changed a choose option in the menu from software to hardware and as a result we did nothing but play, you did not listen to the menu, if I transfer you now to software, you are going to keep choosing the wrong option so you have to call back and do it the proper way. 
So one afternoon, I get a call from an annoyed general practitioner who gave up after a few minutes in the software queue and tried her luck via hardware. Good afternoon, technical services company name, me speaking. I have a software issue and God do not wish to wait in their queue any longer. I want you to connect me to software. No hello of who she is, immediately the demand in the rudest tone I ever witnessed. I am afraid that the quickest way is calling back and waiting the software queue. You will be connected to the first available person. No, I am going to wait and you are going to connect me to the first person available. Me trying to explain that there is no available person available soon because the system would be sure that they would be available for 0.1 second before routing the next caller from the queue to their phone. That could be a while because... I don't care. I am going to wait. Do not hang up and connect me to the first available person. I fear that the wait might be longer than calling back. No, I am not calling back. I waited 30 minutes. I have better things to do. You are going to connect me to the next available person. Me knowing the longest wait in their queue today was like 5 minutes. Really, the quickest way? No, no, no. Do not hang up. I am going to wait till you connect me to the first person that is available. I would not adv- You listen now, I pay your salary. Not true, now hardware contract so she only paid for software support. You are going to do what I say and connect me to the next available person. Me giving up at this point and thinking that it might be a contender for my longest time waiting list. Okay. I will connect you to the first person of software I see available in the system. You better! So I did what I do best with these kinds of people. I made like Clark Gable and I frankly did not give a damn. I muted my headset and started the waiting game to see how long they would wait. After all, there were constantly 10 people waiting in their queue. Small issue after an update, easy fix so that explains the average wait time of only 5 minutes. After a relaxing session of internet that lasted 20 minutes, with an impatient rude lady on my line getting more and more annoyed, I was disturbed by the shout of somebody else on the line that was instructed a couple of minutes before to call software and got through. General practitioner let out a loud, FINALLY, before hanging up on me. After checking the hardware queue and seeing no waiting customers, I decided a trip to the coffee machine was in order so I could share my new record for longest time waiting with my amused colleagues. This story kind of has me wondering, of all the times you guys have called into these kinds of phone lines and had to wait, how long was the longest time you sat there on hold waiting for somebody to connect to you? For me, sometime in the early 2010s, I was calling some kind of phone service and it was probably half an hour for me, so all things considered not terrible, but let me know your times in the comments down below. Our next story is by Chicken and Raffles. I humiliated my verbally abusive third grade teacher because he asked us to do impressions of him. This is a long one, but I have to set the stage. My third grade teacher, Mr. White, looked a lot like Stanley Tucci. Unlike the acting range that Stanley Tucci's characters have, Mr. White had two modes, calm and insane. He was the first teacher I ever had that would scream at us. And I don't mean raise his voice and tell us to be quiet, I mean red-faced crazy guy on the street corner at midnight screaming in your face. Being the naive 8-9 to nine year olds that we were, we just fearfully went with it. It was always over benign stuff too. He loved to single kids out for minor things that irritated him. You talk while he's talking, he would get right in your face and tell you how you've ruined the lesson, then have the class sit in silence for 20 minutes. One time, two kids were having a ruler fight, holding their rulers like swords and pretending to battle in slow motion. Mr. White ran up, snatched both rulers from their hands, snapped them in half across his knee, and dropped the pieces to the floor. Many children shed tears in his class. My biggest mistake was letting a pencil accidentally roll off my desk and hit the floor during a lesson. I vaguely remember him saying beforehand that we played too much with our pencils. Well, that set him off and I was sent outside. Not to the principals, just outside the door to stand in the rain to think about it. Oh, 
and he threw a whiteboard eraser at my friend Jared, which we laugh about to this day, but I see a bit of repressed trauma in Jared's poor little eyes when we do. Eventually, parents begin to catch wind and wonder why their kids were coming home crying, so the principal was contacted. Multiple times, and by the end of the year, Mr. White's outbursts weren't as frequent, but he was still super volatile. So the last day of class comes and Mr. White says he has a fun treat for us. He's going to sit in a chair at the front of the class and we get to line up, face the class and do impressions of him. He says we can make fun of him and his funny little quirks. He wasn't a demon 24-7. He did little things like say, I'm not me until I've had my coffee and step outside to pass gas because he didn't want to poison us. And he always had to wipe his glasses off but couldn't find his lens cleaners. Ha ha, how quirky. And when the other kids got up and started pretending to be Mr. White, that's mostly the kind of stuff they touched on in their fun little ways. He smiled, the kids laughed, how cute. Well, I was about 10th in line and I had a different idea. It was my turn and when I got up to the front, I turned to one of the more abused kids in the class and screamed at the top of my lungs, Jared, if you don't put that crap down, you will be out of my class forever. And Amelia, you need to shut your freaking mouth now, I'm sick of you. And just absolutely went off, pretending to throw crap, etc. The class loved it. Mr. White immediately turned into Mr. Red, but he couldn't say a dang thing about it because he was already on thin ice. Plus, we were moving on from his class anyway, and he knew it was all true. I think the most surprising thing to him was that I was one of the quietest kids that whole year. All he could do was fake a smile, but god darn, he actually looked pissed. The best part is, my imitation got such a kick that a few other kids that went after me did the same thing, just imitating his insane rants and mannerisms. And he had to sit there and take it because it's literally what he asked us to do, act like him. In the final goodbye to his students, he didn't say a word to me, and I was too scared to even approach him. I hope he isn't teaching anymore because he is a true terrifying presence to children. Maybe throwing his fun little exercise back in his face made him get a Thorazine prescription or seek therapy. God knows he needed it. I'm not sure if I needed this story today, I'ma be quite honest. Reading through this made me just have like flashbacks of various experiences all through elementary and middle school and the younger just years of my school experience. I had a fake ruler fight just joking around with a friend in a library once and they banned me from getting books and I had to explain to my teacher why I didn't have any books from the library that day. I had one teacher in middle school that wasn't afraid of screaming and yelling at kids. This story seemed to touch on a lot of memories for me. This next story is by Storymaker1235, how my 8th grade math teacher fought corporate greed and negligence with the power of gummy bears. I know that's a wild ride of a title, but I promise it's all true, so buckle up. When I was in 8th grade, I was in the first year of an experimental technology school. I had a class of about 180 8th graders, 12 to 14 year olds, and about 10 teachers. So everybody shared the same math teacher. For our first semester, we used a software called Gage. It was alright for most classes, but it was absolutely atrocious when it came to math. Nothing worked with math. We were supposed to use the lessons they had, but it just didn't work. Math symbols didn't show up right and some questions even had the wrong answer marked. My math teacher wasn't allowed to just move to paper and the company insisted that the problem was that our math teacher was older and just didn't understand technology. They said that if she had a genuine issue, to email them. One day, I get to class and there are seven email addresses written on the board. She told us that we were going to go through our math lesson today and take screenshots of every mistake we found and email them to the company's executives. One screenshot equals one email. Ten emails equals a packet of gummy bears. We had a blast trying to send as many emails as we could. One kid got ten packets of gummy bears by the end of the hour of class. By lunch, the principal called my teacher aside and asked for her to stop. She said, heck no, my afternoon classes haven't had fun yet. Long story short, 
our school district got all of its money back from using the software and the company no longer exists. Or they changed their brand out of shame. I don't know, I just can't find them anymore. If you want to incentivize a bunch of 12 to 14 year olds, promising some gummy candies is a pretty surefire way to get them motivated. And taking a screenshot and sending an email of it to some email isn't that hard of work, so I'm sure there were plenty of emails sent. Our next story is by Tian Hitchin. Give me a slow laptop and blame me for taking too long to do things? Fine. I know I'll get a better one from you soon enough. Inspired by some of the recent posts about technology woes in school settings, I have one from my middle school years. I was part of a technology pilot program which wanted every kid to have a laptop to accompany their schooling. My school, being in an affluent neighborhood, assumed that every student would bring their own half-decent laptop to class and said they would provide laptops to those who could not afford them. They were right to think that this would be a fairly small amount, at least initially. My parents were unable to buy a laptop after some troubling financial situations arose, so we asked the school to provide one. Oh boy, what a hunk of junk that was. The total polar opposite of the top-end fancy laptops available at the time. It had the computing power of synthetic peanut butter and had the resolution of a knockoff kaleidoscope. I had a lot of fun with that machine. Anyway, it was very, very slow in comparison to what my peers were using. The school, in their infinite wisdom, thought that the, not exaggerating here, I tested it, 10 times slower response time would not be an issue. I informed them that I would be at a significant disadvantage to the other students, but they brushed it off. I was near the top of my class, but not by so far I could just take a handicap like that. But alas, all that protest was in vain. Well, if they wanted it that way, that's what they were going to get. The first computer-based test, 30 minutes. My classmates finished after 15 to 20 minutes. Guess who was stuck there nearly an hour after my classmates? Yeah, that was fun. Somehow, this was my fault, though. The teachers proctoring it knew it wasn't. The IT department knew it wasn't. Yet, it was still my fault for being slow. I got reprimanded for that. So come the next test, I asked to take the test on paper instead. The leader of the pilot program went on this long lecture about how the experience is different. Freak off, it's a math test, how much more different can it be? After another excruciatingly long testing period, the teacher slid me a copy of the paper test and said he'd overlook it for now. My favorite teacher, by the way and submit the test through his own accounting citing technology troubles. Lo and behold, it's literally no different from the test I was just taking. A few days after taking that second test, parents started complaining. Can you guess why? A student who gets good grades is also allowed two times extra time? Yeah, that totally went over well. My grades actually didn't really improve much from that, but the point still stands. Those parents were so infuriated by the disparity in technology available, no doubt wanting their kids not to have anything except at least equal equipment to the others, and that I was getting some sort of advantage somehow, that they pushed for the school to enforce a minimum standard of laptop. Myself? I can't complain too much. I got a free, good laptop. I'm sure there was whatever superintendent at the top pocketing a whole bunch of money, while the kids at the very bottom that couldn't afford the laptop had to deal with inadequate equipment. It's funny how when all the parents start coming together and demand a minimum standard of a good working laptop, all of a sudden, poof, they can just acquire them. It really tells you all you need to know. And our final story of the day is by Concern Secure. Don't want to join the queue? That's fine. Enjoy the wait. This happened a while back, but I only remembered it recently. I work security in a phone shop in a major city. Pretty much the flagship shop's overflow shop, so we aren't busy unless the main shop is packed. That day, both shops were insanely full. There was a large queue in the shop and it wasn't getting smaller. This man walks in and starts walking past the queue. It's not like the queue is hard to miss, so I approach him. 
Excuse me, sir, there's a queue there you need to join. No, I'm fine. Sir, there's a queue, you have to join it if you want to talk to staff. He has now walked past the queue, which is about 10 people big, and is standing opposite the desk by the wall. Sir, if you want to talk to staff, you have to join the queue. I heard you the first time. Okay, but you will not be served before the people in the queue. Whatever, you go back to the door and leave me alone. I look at the manager, and he gives me a nod to let me know he's got this. The man tried a couple of times to be served, but he was first told to join the queue by staff. Then he was just ignored as they served the people in the queue. The queue does not get smaller. In fact, it grows a couple of times. I watch him get annoyed and start huffing and cursing under his breath. He has to wait for almost an hour and a half because he wouldn't join the queue. When the shop is finally empty, the staff take their sweet time with the paperwork. The manager said they could and he would sort him out. The manager approaches him and he's not happy. He complains about the wait and the manager just looks at him with absolute incredulity. He says something racist to the manager and the manager kicks him out. 1. How stupid can you be? And two, I'm surprised that kind of a person didn't get outright belligerent and try chucking stuff around or roughing whoever up. Just kind of get that vibe from this guy. All things considered, he probably let the staff off easy with that. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So, until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.